Sword Pilgrim. Chapter 16. Muffled Voices. A raucous procession. They were all travelers going into and out of Tristar. What's all this about? I think there's an apostate here somewhere. Those are the heretic inquisitors from the Valthorus Church. A pattern of crossed red double swords. It was the symbol of the heretic inquisitors. They're doing interrogations at the checkpoint to find the apostate? Hey, these crazy bastards. If we don't hurry and cross the mountains quickly, we'll fall behind and have to camp out in the open, but these bastards are really being meticulous. I mean, shouldn't the heretic inquisitors be able to root out the apostates just by looking at their divine power? No wonder we keep getting beaten up by the empire. You there, keep it quiet. When the soldier shouted this, the voices quickly reduced to whispers. Master, are you all right? I'm fine, shut up, Bruns. Yeah. The Inquisitor asked, pointing to the man in the hood. Wait, you there. ID? Here. The Inquisitor checked the ID, turning it front and back. Take that hood off for a moment. Why are you asking him to take his hood off? Master doesn't like to show his face. One of the traits of the apostate is his eyes. He has gray eyes, which are rare, so take the hood off. No, but this gentleman. Calm down, Bruns. It's fine to take it off. Saw. As the hood was pulled back, a handsome man with clear features and black eyes appeared. Hmm, you have good eyes. The black eyes sparkled exceptionally. They're hereditary. Hmm, pass. Callius put his head back on and passed the Inquisitor. After a while, Callius stopped in the woods heading north through the wide plains of Tristar and reached out to Bruns. Here you go. Hmm. When Bruns handed him a small container, he opened it and touched his eyeballs with his hand to pluck some things out, which were put into the container. Are you all right? My eyes feel stiff. It doesn't look like you can wear these for a long time. There were two lenses in the box. It was a pair of black lenses made of glass, made by special order to Dexter. You can't do this twice. In the Middle Ages, it was said that the lenses used to be made of glass, so I had these made. But it was more painful than I'd thought. In this era, the concept of advanced components such as silicone was not well known, so only glass lenses were available. At least this was possible because Callius' physical abilities were superior to ordinary people. If an average criminal had used such a thing, the cornea would have been injured in no time. Let's go. We have a busy road ahead. Yeah. That was then. It really was you. A voice cold as frost. A strange presence attacked Callius. He immediately drew Arsando. Chiang. Cook. Kikig. Kikikigig. Sparks flew as one sword struck another. The bushes shook, and the periwinkle hair of his enemy fluttered in his front. Even if you deceive that extremist inquisitor, you cannot deceive my eyes that know your face. The Cloak of Twilight. That was you, too. Esther Sol Ciliad. The Next Paladin. A genius among geniuses who was referred to as the next saint. A woman who could not but be praised for her swordsmanship, divine power, beauty and grace. Esther. Her water-colored hair shined softly in the light as if she was an apostle sent down by the god Valthorus himself. Her eyes were blue dark as if they contained all the depths of an ocean. Your voice. Your face. And your gaze too. I've never forgotten. It's such an honor for the next saint to say that. At first glance, her words sounded like a hymn of love, but that wasn't the atmosphere at all. I don't know why she's glaring like I'm her ancestral enemy. Does she have a grudge against Callius, one that I don't know about? I don't know. That's one part that I don't know. This is a part that hasn't been said at all. So, it's even more confusing. Three years ago, 
I told you. Pilgrim Callius. What do you mean? Did you forget? Then I'll tell you again. Esther's sword pointed down. She fixed her posture. She lowered the sword she was holding with both hands at an angle. I made it clear at the time. If I come across you as a pilgrim, on my pilgrimage, I will definitely kill you. I, Pilgrim Esther, challenge Pilgrim Callius to a sword duel. The duel won't end until someone died and turned into the opponent's sword. Pilgrim Callius. Please, don't die too easily. I've been looking forward to this moment for so long. Shick! Esther disappeared with the sound of a sharp wind. Fast. Sock. Her sword flew through the spot where Callius's neck was a moment before. Fast. And gorgeous. Her sword was like that. It was quick and accurate. At first, she approached so quickly that he didn't even notice she was approaching, and in an instant she drew her sword and cut. Sue. She cut two or three times in the fleeting moment it would take somebody else to swing once. Quick sword. It was a quick sword that was hard to follow or chase after. Chiang. Chwak. Kugagum. Kwong. Bruns ran into the woods and couldn't figure out what was going on. He hid among the bushes and peered through the trees to see the fierce battle between Callius and Esther. Sparks fluttered between the sword strikes that were too fast to be seen, and trees were cut down and collapsed in instants. Gulp. This was a true fight between pilgrims. It's not the time to be thrilled. Ah, but there's no way for me to help master. All he could do was watch from afar. Chiang. The power is getting worse again. It wasn't just speed. Her power was equally strong. The quality of divine power was also high. Perhaps it was because he had observed the divine power contained in the sacred stone, so her level could be captured at a glance. Her divine power was level 3. No, it would soon become level 2. The purity of the divine power was exceptional. It's only been three years and you've reached this level. That's great. You were a person who knew how to grow, too. I didn't expect you to receive my sword this far. Because time is fair to everyone. He was doing his best, but his right hand holding the sword still trembled. If it wasn't for the glove I got from Dexter, my hands would have exploded already. Because her sword was fast and heavy. Nimble movements. And the calmness of divine power that suited her. All in all, her heightened physical abilities and unique quick sword gave the illusion that many swords were flying in from all directions. As if. It felt like being in the middle of a torrential rain. You try to avoid it, but you can't. The more you try to catch it at one place, the faster it comes to stab from another place. Ho! Oh. Dozens of shallow sword cuts had appeared on his arms and legs during that brief exchange. Is this because of the cloak? Of course. Of course, it's something I've been looking for but I'm not doing something like this just because of that. Then why? Don't you remember? I don't. I forgot everything in my past. She lowered her sword and slowly closed her eyelids. Her long eyelashes were trembling, and she looked quite pissed off. You are a genius at making people angry. What did I do to you? What you did? What you did? No one else knows and even you don't remember, so it's like you never did anything at all, right? She spat out in fervid anger without giving a concrete answer. Esther was definitely not supposed to be like that. She never got very angry, nor sad. She was cold and rigid. A woman who was merciless to demons and beasts, but kind to children. That was Esther's sole ciliad. Hmm. I honestly don't know. I know Callius this bastard probably didn't sit still in the church, but I don't know if he did anything to Esther. Could he really have done something? To Esther. Just when I was about to start thinking. Esther's mouth opened. You approached me first, 
but when you found out that I wasn't from a noble family you started treating me badly. Ah. Uh. And for some reason you began to despise me and even torment the commoner-born monks around me. Ah, uh, is that so? Not only that. You asked me to practice swordsmanship with you, and after you were defeated, you did all sorts of absurd things. They were frivolous things like putting in nails in Esther's wooden sword's handle, and putting needles in her shoes. Forming a group with aristocrats, he harassed the commoners and punished anyone who spoke to Esther. That's what he did. I kept apologizing to you all along. I did it even though I hadn't done anything wrong. But you just kept bothering me even more. Um. I see. I will kill you. Your very existence is evil. You are no different from monsters. Is that so? I have nothing to say. I mean, those things were definitely not things I did, but now that it has come to this, what can I say? Even if I have ten mouths, there is nothing to say. Callius, is this guy crazy? I don't know about the others, but even Esther. But I think I knew why. As soon as he saw Esther, the heart of Callius must have fluttered like a fish jumping out of the water. He, probably. You must have liked Esther. There were few who didn't like her. Because she was beautiful and strong. Strong enough to be referred to as the next paladin, and kind enough to be referred to as the next saint. She was like a sharpened sword right now, but as time passes and she bridges the gap between life and death many times, she gradually acquires the character of a saint. So Callius must have liked Esther too. He was also human. If he hadn't been interested, he wouldn't have bothered her that much. He had a crush on her, fell in love with her, but it seemed that her not being from a noble family was somehow unacceptable. So it must have been. In the first place, he had the trait of the prodigal son of the church. There wasn't a woman he hadn't pursued. Silly Callius. But now that's me. Why did you do that? She changed the foot she was stepping on. Quickly, her sword pierced through. I raised Arsando. Her sword committed. But at that moment, the trajectory twisted. Kigajigig. Her sword slid up the flat of Arsando's blade. Sook. As I tilted my head back, a clear deep line was drawn on the nape of my neck. Julig. Drops of blood formed along that line. And in the moment they started flowing. Poke. Cock. Her kick pierced my stomach like a crossbow through my neglected guard. Kwong. Sheech. A stab came in once again. It was aiming for my head. Damn it. Your eyes are better than before. You dodge my sword quite well. I bowed my head to avoid the sword. Esther's sword pierced the tree behind me. Is this also the power of the holy relic? Did you come to find the relic too? My job is to find the relic. And killing me? That's private. What the? Laughter flowed out. It was a situation where I had no choice but to be nervous, but even though death was close at hand, strangely I laughed. What's funny? It's just funny. It's funny that you're standing now front of me, and I can't believe that you came to kill me. It's no joke. Yeah, I guess. Who? Callius sighed heavily and looked into Esther's eyes. There are no relics. If I had such a thing, I wouldn't have needed to groan like this. Is that so? Yeah. The miracle of the holy relic that the church could not find in the first place is not something like this. I thought so. Do you believe me? At least as far as I know, you were proud of yourself as a nobleman. A nobleman who did not lie, although he did utter rude remarks. Thank you for believing in me like that. It's a pity that there are no holy relics. You're still going to kill me. Yes, because that's what I decided to do. So, kill me. Simple and clear. Well, according to her, she had been bullied since she became a nun, so how long had it been? 
that's good enough of a reason. Callius must have had been arrogant in front of her, flaunting his status as an aristocrat, since he couldn't compete with her in swordsmanship. I'd want to kill me too. But I can't die. I can't die so easily. It would have been an honor to die at your hand. Is that so? But I can't die yet. It's not up to you to decide. Her drawn sword was directed at my neck. It's up to me to decide. Soon, her sword swung. Before my neck fell. I untied the bracelet. Click. Then with the divine power that was bound in it. Talent, death verse composition, die not before the hour, enlightenment of the dying is activated. Death verse composition. A unique characteristic of Callius. It was triggered by Esther's sword, only possible when he truly realized that death was here for him. Divine power overflowing like a broken dam. And the characteristic enlightenment. Everything harmonized. The amount of divine power in the elixir field increased. But it was actually not as big as it used to be. Bit by bit, one by one, it was compressed. Slowly and densely, it was refined. Now it sat firmly and took shape. Silver buds stacked in layers. Sook. Callius' gray eyes gleamed with silver. Six peak flowers bloom in late season has reached the first layer. Six peak flowers bloom in late season. Grade, unique. Achievement, first layer. Six buds blooming in late season. The divine power of Esther's sword. The streams of divine power that were nestled within her sword were clearly visible. Bloom. Kong. There was a sharp and keening sound of iron. Esther's sword bounced off. Her eyes were shaking. Her swordsmanship was broken. Light burst from the explosion fell around them like petals. A swordsmanship that breaks the opponent's swordsmanship using their own divine power against them. Its name was given because it was as beautiful as silver petals. Silver Flower Wave Sword, 1. Chapter 17 Ching. A sharp keening as if iron was being torn apart struck the eardrums. Both their hands were deflected high towards the sky. However, there was only one hand still holding a sword. Warwick. A single sword tumbled through the air. And soon fell to the ground. P.U.K. Silver petals danced between them like shards of broken glass. How can you? Esther's eyes were bewildered and astonished. And filled with an overwhelming excitement. Several emotions were mixed in those eyes. There was no sword in her hand. Only one blow. It felt like a swift thunderbolt, yet that sword was beautiful to see. Once upon a time. With one sword, Saint Stella had built the church of today. A feat that no one else has equaled since. Six peak flowers bloom in late season, silver flower wave sword. Esther was speechless for a while. And, it was the same with Callius. What did I just do? In an instant, he achieved enlightenment. It was thanks to his unique characteristic that he could unlock only just before he died. Of course, I knew. I intended it. I loosened Vivi's bracelet just in time tasted the explosive divine power, and awakened to enlightenment. But that enlightenment was fleeting. A fleeting, split second. However, the wonder of it made me ponder a lot. The ground that split long behind Esther. The woods and the trees, cut down. It was as if a giant sword had cleaved through the earth. It's your defeat. Esther. I don't know the detailed process. My head is still hazy. It's like dreaming. But it's not a dream. Esther in front of me lost her sword, and I am the one still holding mine. If so, it is better to clarify the facts. What happened to my arm? It looks like a damn harpoon. In this state, there is no strength left to move even one fingertip. Obviously, Vivi's bracelet has just been loosened, but there is still not much divine power left. 
it was because I had consumed most of it with just one blow. Perhaps because of crossing my limits, fatigue quickly sets in. There is a feeling of lethargy that will make you faint even if you release the slightest tension. Nevertheless. That's why. Callius had to speak. You, how can you use that sword? Esther Sol Ciliad. The loser has no right to question. She bit her lip. And I slowly closed my eyes. Go. All I can do now is simply bluff and show a facade of bravado. That's it. As you said, I was defeated. Are you not taking my life? You must not kill the woman who will later become the most powerful sword of the order. Because her existence, even if only a little bit, can help withstand the empire. You must live. What is that supposed to mean? She has a grimacing face, as if I'm talking nonsense. But she has to live. When the main quest begins, the kingdom will tremble and shake. Esther is the one who can soothe it. She is somebody who will rise to the rank of the masters later. Without her, my survival is also merely a candle in a storm. So, she has to live. Esther, stay by Solivian's side. Her death is imminent. You! Esther was startled. Solivian is a cardinal of the Order of Valtheris, a famous alchemist, and at the same time, a prophet. She is the one who took care of Esther, and is destined to become her sword. After her death, Esther follows her wishes and turns Sullivan into a sword, a vision sword that brings miracles to allies and disasters to enemies. You will have a vision sword, Solivian. You are a woman who cannot afford to waste any more time here. Go. I can't even stand any longer. I felt regretful inside, but it was right that I had to let her go. The dignity of an aristocrat was holding tightly to the spirit that was about to disperse. Esther pursed her lips as if she wanted to say something more, then clenched her fists and turned her back. Aren't you taking your sword? Due to her personality, since she did not lose her life in the sword duel even though she was defeated, she must have decided to leave her sword behind. After a while, only after feeling her presence vanish in the distance, Callius drooped down. I almost died. I was really about to die. I couldn't believe that Esther almost killed me. It was absurd and I just laughed. It hurts so bad. Kulek. Blood spilled out. Looked like there was an internal wound. Well, my whole body was full of wounds. It was a miracle that I was alive. It looked like the intestines burst after being hit by dozens of sword slashes and then that great spinning kick. But nevertheless. I survived. Ka. Ha ha ha. Callius rubbed his forehead and chuckled like crazy. Blood gushed out of his mouth every time he smiled, but he couldn't stop himself. He survived Esther Sol Ciliad, who was considered to be the next paladin. Six peak flowers technique completed a single layer, and made one swing of the silver flower wave sword. Broke Esther's sword, and showed off a blooming silver flower. A trash swordsman survived Esther, a genius among geniuses. I was very happy with this fact. Ha! The efforts of the past three years have not been in vain. It wasn't for nothing. The strange sense of satisfaction welling up from that fact. And the overwhelming relief, combined to make Callius' eyelids heavy. Did I bleed too much? The twilight cloak was made to keep off the cold, but it still felt strangely cold. I don't think it should be delayed any longer. Callius immediately took out a bottle of holy water that had been stored in the stigma. He gulped most of it down in one breath and scattered the rest all over his body. After a while, a loud scream resounded in the forest. Then it became quiet like a mouse. A few days later. Carpe Royal Palace, Outer Castle. A middle-aged woman lay in a beautifully decorated bedroom. Esther walked over to her and squeezed her hand. There were a lot of strange things in the room that didn't suit the kingdom of Carpe. 
artifacts, and alchemic items. She was a woman descended from Bright, a distant cousin of the House of Carpe. A royal cousin, and honorary cardinal of the Order of Valphorus. A sage and a prophet. Silivian Vaughn Alid Bright. Oh, he had Saint Stella's swordsmanship, it must have been beautiful. She was Esther Sol Ciliad's guardian and only protector. Yes. It was beautiful. The prophet might not be me, but him. The one called Callius. Yes. He foresaw my death. Yes. He told me to stay. My death, I did not foresee. But he did. Silivian was still calm discussing the prediction of her own death. Her condition was a top secret among top secrets. Only Esther and a few members of the royal family knew. It was not something that Callius could know. Esther. Yes. Get close to him. Why? He said he couldn't kill you. An opponent who did not kill her. One who learned the swordsmanship of a saint. It was a good idea for him and Esther to become close. But something like that. Don't turn your face and avoid the issue. Esther tilted her head in confusion. Do you think he had me in his heart? It seems that way to me. Nonsense. Everything he did was horrendous. All my hatred that he caused. I thought it was because he hated me, because I was a poor commoner. But was it all just a joke to get my attention? That man's family likes to play pranks even when they're old. But when they have to speak, they speak more reliably than anyone else in the world. Maybe. Or maybe not. He might have put in all that effort to become a person that suits you. However, he might be apologizing. You don't have a single wound on your body. No matter how much he mastered Stella's sword, it wouldn't have been easy to subdue someone as powerful as you without leaving any scars. Esther had nothing to say. How did he look? Terrible, he looked terrible. And you? There was nothing wrong, except a small tear on the hand. Seeing that, yes. While using the Silver Flower Wave Sword, he silently avoided damaging his opponent. I wish I had that kind of ability. But I don't. At the very end, just before the sword touched her neck, he stopped the silver petals. That's the way men are. A naive idiot who seems he'll never become a grown-up, when something heavy is on his shoulder, can change so much. What's on his shoulder? Well, I don't know. Then, you'll have to figure that out first. I know you because I've been with you for so long. You're the one who always liked the tales of the saint. You'll want to compete with him once again. However, now do what he says. Since my remaining life is short. Because I have too little time left to lose you to him. 1. Tick, tick. A black shadow could be seen before the bonfire and the sparking firewood. The shadow was a human, burning something. It was Bronze who had soot on his face and was eating something alone. Bronze, the servant of Callius. Are you eating alone? Ah. Master. Are you awake? Surprised, Bronze threw away the meat skewers he was eating and ran to Callius. I'm going to die of a lack of energy. There were no wounds on the body. His divine power had returned quite a bit, and it seemed that his wounds were healed with holy water. Seeing that there was no scar, the effect was clear. Although, because it was incomplete holy water, he fainted from the rising pain during the healing process. Did this guy survive that kind of pain? He didn't go crazy. Let's have a drink first. Heal a lug. Callius took a sip and immediately spat it out. You bastard, what did you put in? Spicy, salty, and bitter. What could have been added to make it taste like this? No, how is it possible to have such a colorful and dirty taste? I'm still not feeling well, but my fever is soaring. Should I boil it again? Fine. Give me the meat. 
After all, there was nothing that could not be digested by the characteristic of gluttony. Callius did not stop and pat his stomach until he finished off dozens of the meat skewers Bruns had grilled. You eat them all. What did you say? Oh, nothing. Are you feeling better? I was really surprised. At first I thought you were dead. Um, did you? Well, he must have been lying on the floor covered in blood, so that's expected. Callius, somewhat full, leaned his back against the wall and looked around. It was a deep cave inside the forest. Brun said he had been here looking after him for over a week. Thanks to this, all the meat they brought from Tristar ran out, and he said that he would have to find food and drinking water. Why did you eat all my meat? Yes, yes. That, that's right, I have to eat to take care of Master. Bruns complained with resentment. Go hunt as much as you've eaten. You're too much. I mean, I think I'll have to stay here for a day or two more. Are you still unwell? The fatigue was great. Esther had left, but the Iron Grace Inquisitor must still be pursuing him. If I ran into him with a body like this, I didn't think I would be able to run properly. You talk a lot. Do you want to die? I, I'll go. Callius clicked his tongue as he saw Bruns run back and forth. I'd brought so much food, but ten days' worth of food had already run out. How much are you eating? T T T. Callius wet his lips with his tongue and then closed his eyes, quietly contemplating his body. A small bud in the lower abdomen. Its existence was felt more clearly than before. Callius von Gervain. Occupation, Pilgrim. Spirit, Level 4. Divine Power, 2571-4251. Talent, Bard's Blessing, Best. Characteristics, Verse of Grace, Nobility's Duty, Scapegrace of the Count Family, Death Verse Composition, Prodigal Son of the Order, Gluttony, Tricolor Eye. Ability. Strength, 22-26+. 10. Agility, 15 plus, 10. Skill, 8 12. Health, 15 17 plus, 10. Faith, 21 23. Perhaps because he learned the six peak flowers technique, his overall ability and divine power increased significantly. All stats excluding agility plus 2. And the amount of divine power had increased by about a thousand. It was possibly the remaining influence of the manipulations of divine power or related to the Enlightenment while completing the first layer of the Six Peak Flowers technique. Have I finally started walking on the road now? Three years. Only now, I was able to walk properly on my journey. Now is the start. Now, I am finally standing on the same starting line as them. I was happy enough to cry, but I purposely calmed my heart even more. Who? There is a long way to go. It's still too early. There is only one bud of divine power perched on the elixir field. You have to make six and burn them all to offerings before you can call it the complete six peak flowers bloom in late season. There are too many strong people in this world to be happy with just one. A lot of it depended on Locke. In the duel with Esther, he relied mostly on Locke. He believed in his unique characteristic, but it was too close. If he had done it wrong, he might have died before the trait even activated. Callius grabbed one of the two swords on the side of the cave. I can't use Arsando anymore. Arsando. If it was whole, it could be used, but a lot of the edge had degraded. If there was only one, I would have just used it, but now I don't have to. Because there was Esther's sword. Lucen. Grade, Life Sword. Infused Soul, Lucen Duvalis. A sword imbued with Lucen's soul. It was a sword that fell only a slight distance short of the ranks of spirit swords. Among the top five life swords in the church's long time custody. There are few blemishes. Since it is a sword that is close to a spirit sword, it is a sword with a good sense of weight and balance. 
because I had missed striking the sword, there were hardly any traces of being damaged by the silver flower wave sword. Is there no verse of grace? There was no hidden verse. It seemed that corpse grace would not appear unless it was a carcass he made himself. He shook his head and grabbed Arsando again. Now it's the time to let this guy go. Callius drew Arsando's carcass. The light of divine power shone brilliantly around the sword. Like a saint praying to God, his appearance was like that of a devout believer. You led the soul to the side of God. The reward for offering a life sword is given. Skill plus one. Chapter 18. Life Sword Listen. It was narrower than Arsando. But it was longer. It had the shape of a general longsword, but with a good sense of weight and balance. The blade was double-edged so the sword could be used with one or both hands. Callius settled Lucin in his hands and calmly closed his eyes. I felt the wind. The sound of the bushes rustling. But soon the senses of touch and hearing were suppressed. Only the sword. And me. That was all there was left in the world. The elixir field prickled. The first bud of six peak flowers slowly bloomed. The inherent divine power flowed through the whole body and strengthened it. Then, soon after, it approached Lucin through his fingertips and wrapped around it. The divine power gathered like a chain, entangled and twisted. The densely gathered energy aggregated into one shape and formed on the blade surface. Flash. I opened my eyes and swung Lucian horizontally. A simple slash. Sook. However, that cut was far from simple. Kugum. Kugugugum. A tree that must have had been several centuries old was neatly cut down. Its circumference was too wide to be embraced by three strong men with their arms wide open, but in front of Callius, it was cut off as easily as a bale of straw. Not bad. This time I managed to properly ferment the technique of six peak flowers bloom in late season, silver flower wave sword. As six peak flowers technique took root in the elixir field, my overall physical ability was also getting better. It felt like my body was transforming to something new. Of course, the divine power is insufficient. There was only one simple bud in my elixir field, indicating the first layer of six peak flowers bloom in late season. The bud is usually responsible for storing divine power and filtering out impurities. But when needed, the bud unfolds and blooms, exuding a stronger form of divine power. Unfolding into the silver flower wave sword. It's still not enough. It's not even unfolding properly. The quality, as well as the quantity, is lacking. Obviously, the total amount of divine power has increased by about a thousand compared to the original, but it is still not enough. Perhaps it's a matter of purity, which is only at the fourth grade. It's sad, but it can't be helped. The quality of spiritual power is a problem that cannot be dealt with right now. At least I got one attribute point. Although my technique still lacks the original power of six peak flowers bloom in late season, I have gained a bit more of the swordsmanship skill, which helps the skill usage. It didn't change anything special that much, but everything to do with a sword feels strangely easier. You use less of the muscles that you don't need and more of the muscles you should use. It may not seem like much, but it allows the sword to advance more quickly along the path it needs to take. Unneeded cruft in your technique disappears. Swordsmanship is about seizing the victory in a life or death battle using that kind of a subtle difference. Slowly, my body got better. Callius, after putting the famous sword Lucin into a simple sheath, put on the cloak of twilight that he had shrugged off earlier, and turned his head. Is Bruns over there? It was quite far away, but after learning six peak flowers bloom in late season, all my senses sharpened. I had to walk about a hundred meters. Bruns was there. What are you doing? Master. I'm catching fish. Bruns, who had found his way to the center of a fairly large river valley, 
boasted that he was confident in catching fish, so just wait a while. Bruns did not move, as cautious as a bear trying to catch salmons. Hmm, this guy is pretty sturdy. But he's pretty useless. Bruns, who had shouted that he would catch a fish soon, couldn't catch any fish in the end, and blamed the valley water for it. It seems that there are no fish because the quality of the water is different from my hometown. You're useless. Eventually, Callius blew the flute. The hares pricked up their ears at his sweet performance and approached him. He played a little more without moving, and this time even a deer approached, full of curiosity. It was then that Callius drew his sword. Chwank! Padadadak! The other beasts escaped, but the deer couldn't. The deer, decapitated in one swing, died, and Bruns rejoiced and began to skin and trim the meat. It's master after all. Ha ha. The head of a deer plops down once you draw a sword. Bruns. Yes. Master. Shut up and grill. Yep. I hate to admit it, but I'm getting used to living with him. It's true that he's useless, but it's comfortable because there's nothing problematic in dealing with Bruns. No matter what you spit out, he responds vigorously and tries to be helpful. He's really weird. Bruns. Yes, I am here. Bruns handed the well-roasted deer hind legs to Callius. Some of them were a little too charred. At least he got the best ones. Herbs, salt, and pepper were also sprinkled to remove the bitterness. All seasonings were brought from Tristar. The seasonings were finished to taste. Callius ate the deer's hind legs with a fork and knife even though he was camping. The meat was somehow edible. He finished his meal after eating the whole deer, probably because the gluttony trait had activated. Bruns. Yes? Would you like more? Bruns sobbed as he held what he was eating. No, I have a question for you. Oh, yeah. Just ask. Why are you following me? I just wanted to ask you once. Of course. From that day onwards, my life is no longer mine. From that day? Not knowing what to say, Callius kept his mouth shut for a long time. Have you already forgotten? You made all my brothers into swords and sold them, went to the casino and slaughtered the Luton's knights. Yes, that day. But why? When I saw your gambling skills at that time, I, Bruns, fell in love with it. A battle between true men, to make a bet with yourself as the stake. And when? Ruthlessness to cut down the enemies who could not accept the outcome with a single sword. And at the base of it all, the ability to turn a crisis into an opportunity. I fell in love with Master's manliness, so I wanted to offer my allegiance. Right. Do you see? The purity of my heart? It's your heart, what's there for me to see? When you've finished eating, get up. We've got a busy road ahead. Oh, yes. Bruns, who got up scratching the back of his head in embarrassment, overturned the soil as if he was familiar with the process and erased all traces of their camp. And then, at the moment when he was about to erase the final trace by kicking the leftover bones of the deer. Whoa, ah, ah, ah. Suddenly, Bruns left a flurried shout and disappeared literally, disappeared. Callius wondered if there was a mystery here that he was not aware of, but upon closer inspection, he realized that Bruns had simply fallen into a strange pit. It was deep enough that even the bottom was out of sight. Since he couldn't even see Bruns' figure from above, it really looked quite deep. Bruns. I won't forget you. If it was that deep, he'd be dead. He was not a pilgrim, so it would have been difficult to survive. I'm sorry, but I can't help it. I'll live for your share too. Just as I was about to turn around and leave alone with my back. A sound came from inside the pit. Master. What, were you alive? Were you just leaving me here? Of course not. He was quick on the uptake. Can you come up? 
that would be a bit difficult. But there's a door down here, so it looks like there's a passage to somewhere. Door? Passage? So, looks like it's not a naturally created pit. Hmm, if it's a door to a basement that deep underground. There is one thing that comes to mind. Callius immediately raised his divine power to protect himself and descended into the pit. Huang. Kuang. He was prepared for a shock because it was a long fall, but in the end, there was no need for that. He'd forgotten that fall mitigation was one of the abilities of the Twilight Cloak. Master. You really came this far for me. Shut up and get out of the way. Callius pushed the approaching bronze and looked at the door on the wall. It wasn't just a simple door. It was an iron gate with an engraved geometric pattern. Callius knew where these gates would usually be located. An alchemist's underground laboratory. Alchemists were those who researched the sorcery of the spirit, alchemy, sometimes also called enchanting. They either did not have much interest in swordsmanship or had no talent in it, so they studied relics as well as artifacts that are imitations of relics. What is this? Traces left by an alchemist. Perhaps, this door has been engraved with an alchemical technique. Bruns made a face that he didn't quite understand. It's kind of like, a lock made from divine power. You can think of it as a seal, hmm, it's easier to think of it as a barrier. Ah. Callius stretched out his hand as he looked at the iron gate and its alchemic engraving. Also, it was a door with an active alchemic seal. It won't open with just force. An intangible energy was firmly blocking him as if it was protecting that iron gate. To open this kind of door, it was usually one of two ways. Either you open it from the inside, or you smash it from the outside. Callius chose the latter. Is it okay to break this? This was a guy who worked underground in secret like this. If the research was something reasonable, he wouldn't have done this. Alchemists are precious. They create artifacts that are close to sacred objects, and through various research, sometimes create body-protecting and area-protecting objects. Even in the Carpe Royal Castle alone, there were many barriers and traps made with the artifacts of the alchemists. From the point of view of the churches and the nations, alchemists are indeed precious. They are beings that need to be protected. However, not all alchemists create only such beneficial things. Where is the place of good or evil in the path of science? Those who seek knowledge naturally tend to forget the existence of such petty things. Those who have things to study out of the human eye are usually bad guys. Sook! As if the flash had taken no time at all, Callia's sword returned to its sheath. Kieg, Kuang! The iron gate was cut into two. The sword, which had been momentarily clad in silver, easily broke the alchemic barrier. Done. Yeah. But Callius did not take the lead. He glanced at Bruns and blinked. It was a gesture to step ahead. Bruns wept. There are still five bottles of holy water. You're too much. As if he had been betrayed by the world. Bruns began to lead the way. Bruns initially went ahead while twitching nervously, but soon he began to walk more and more normally. There doesn't seem to be anything here. Right. It was just a long, long passage. Callius raised his hand and radiated divine power to create a bright light. Looks like the passage split here. Right. There was a fork in the passage. After thinking for a moment, he turned to the right. Where did I feel this energy? On the right side of the fork, he could feel a strange sense of deja vu. That was then. There was a body fallen in the passage. Oh, master. I see it. A dead body, leaning against the walls. Are you the alchemist? Death wasn't too long ago. The corpse was in good condition, and there was no smell of rot. What's the cause of death? No sign of trauma. Maybe it was an illness. Callius guessed. Too young for a natural death, 
and a clean body that didn't look poisoned. He wondered if it was some kind of chronic illness or just a sudden death. Let's find out. A faint light shone from the body. He seemed to have a lot of regrets. Callius immediately turned the cadaver into a carcass. Well, memories flew into his mind. Memories of this underground research. Regrets for successes not achieved. Callius saw the two-handed sword in his hand. Rogerus. Grade, carcass sword. Infused soul, Rogerus won. Rogerus bitter sword. He wanted to complete his research. Rogerus. It wasn't fully clear. But he could guess the broad strokes based on what he knew. Callius walked straight through the passage without hesitation. He soon found the piles of papers, and buried in them, a research journal. Rogerus Research Journal Why does God perform miracles only for the humans and the humanoid subspecies? Why are his miracles only for the corpses of humans and humanoids? Omitted Why can't I make a carcass from the corpse of a beast? Why not monsters? I question this, and study the knowledge declared taboo. Taboo. Ill-advised areas of study. Research explicitly prohibited by the church. God's miracles are only for humans. So what about the demi-human races? Are all the humanoid subspecies, human too? For the gods, humans and demi-humans seem to be distinguished as sapient life born from a single branch. Gods probably treat the demi-humans the same as humans. They can also perform the miracle of the carcass. What about a beast stronger than a human? Wouldn't a more powerful sword appear if a stronger monster was made into a carcass? There had been many pilgrims who thought so. But God's miracles are directed only towards humans. Human. So, what are the standards for defining a human? Roger's research started from that. The upper body of a human and the lower body of a monster. The arm of a monster and a human body. It was an ugly research journal mixed with intellectual curiosity and the desire to make a stronger sword. Biological experiments prohibited by the church. The journal logged the progress of such experiments. And did you finally find the answer? A composite of human and monster. A chimera. Dot. One. It seemed that the research was carried out with that goal in mind. It started with mating, artificial insemination, ovulation, etc. There were a lot of messy research processes. However, he eventually made several chimera through trial and error, then killed them and turned them into swords. Rogerus. The completion of his desired research. His magnum opus. Killing, Lowe's the most complete test body, and turning it into a sword. That was his wish. Master. Callius immediately turned and left the lab. He walked back to the mouth of the fork and took the left passage. Sook. When he turned his head, the side of the passage was full of glass tubes large enough to hold a person. There were some holding what looked like monsters, and some holding what looked like humans. However, the place Callius' eyes turned to was the very end of the biological laboratory. There, something that was neither human nor monster was wriggling inside the glass. A human monster composite. A chimera. Was this really a human, or a monster? What would God define this as? Although he knew the truth, Callius raised his sword. Chapter 19 the Biological Experiments of Rogerus Wan. As soon as I saw the name of the unknown alchemist I had turned into a carcass, memories of the past came like a deluge. An Easter egg in the game. Secret Dungeon. Hidden Peace, 1. A Secret Item. Master, are you alright? Fine. Callius actually wasn't in very good condition. He wasn't hurt anywhere but he was exhausted mentally and physically from a pretty intense battle. The chimera within the glass tube, Lowe's. Rogerus's test subject that broke the tube and ran wild the moment Callius raised the sword. 
It was not afraid of Callia's sword, and even when its limbs were severed, it devoured the monsters sleeping in the other tubes and regenerated. There wasn't any time to ponder more deeply whether it was really a human, or a monster. Callius used the silver flower wave sword, and chopped it into two pieces. Roger's test subject, complete. Strength plus two. Roger's carcass turned into light and disappeared, leaving Callius two swords. One, Lucen, the life sword left behind by Esther. Another. Predator sword, Lowe's. Grade, life sword. Inhabited soul, a mixed soul. The test subject that was the culmination of Rogerus' research. Although it was the last chimera Rogerus created, it was turned into a sword by Callius von Gervain. Unique ability, predation. Predation count, zero. Predator sword, Lowe's. A sword with a vicious, serrated blade, like the teeth of an animal. The blade looked as if it had been deliberately broken, and pulsed with a greed for flesh and blood. The predator sword wore the form of a single-edged sword, and had unique abilities despite being only a life sword. It had a unique ability, that only spirit swords or swords of even higher rank were supposed to have. Predation The name of the unique ability literally described the quality of one who preyed on flesh and blood. Although it was only a life sword by its rank, if the predation count exceeded a hundred, the sword could grow further, and the same if it went over a thousand. A sword that could become a spirit sword or even a vision sword. That was the predator sword, Lowe's. A so-called growth type sword. But why does it have a scabbard? As far as I know, a carcass never has a scabbard. Originally, that's how it was supposed to be. A carcass has no scabbard. Even Lucen was held in a temporary scabbard. This is because a carcass sword is meant to finally return to the bosom of God, so a scabbard is meaningless. However, for the predator sword that was made from a cadaver of something neither a human nor a monster, a scabbard came included. The soul of a mixed existence was a setting that God rejected. That is the reason behind the scabbard. Predator sword lows. A sword with no resting place to return to. So, wrapped within a scabbard, it appeared in front of his eyes. TCH. Callius clicked his tongue. If something was going to come out, a different sword would have been better. The predator sword is literally a growth type. It is a sword that has the advantage of being able to grow to a higher grade, but in the second half of the game, it will only become a hindrance because even if the grade goes up, the unique ability does not change. Although the strength of the unique ability also grows stronger, compared to other spirit swords and vision swords, it's quite ordinary. Devouring prey. And growing stronger. Just this. Compared to the top-notch swords that can breathe fire and cause natural disasters, the ability is rather shabby. Cheek. With the predator sword back in its sheath, Callius swept up his flowing hair into a lock and looked at bronze. Did you find the exit? Yeah. It's over here. He nodded and walked straight to the exit. Of course, for now it's still somewhat helpful. Only, it was a bit sad. There are many dungeons hidden in Carpe. There are even many people, not just Rogerus, who conduct experiments forbidden by the church, including biological experiments. Among the dogs of the empire, there are a lot of alchemists who do such baroque experiments. If you find and defeat such hidden dungeons, you can get better swords. But the problem is. They're hard to find. The dungeons were not conceived by him, so Callius himself had no knowledge of their locations. The idea of the alchemist's dungeons came from somebody else. It was a part that the game director randomly put in during a meeting and he was not involved, so he only heard about it later from a company colleague. If it wasn't for Bruns, even Roger's laboratory would have been overlooked this time. Were you looking for it or something? No? So, finding it was really fortunate. But that's why it was even more disappointing. Predator Sword 
For Callius, who didn't even have a spirit sword, it was of course better to have the predator sword than not, but the human heart is fickle and grasping. It was a bit disappointing to think that he lost an opportunity to get other, better swords. But I can't help it. Until you find your own, true sword as a pilgrim. The more swords, the better. Although high-grade swords do not, but swords below spirit grade break often. If you think about it that way, the predator sword is good. Even if it gets broken, it will regenerate if you feed it with blood. Now that this has happened, as a pilgrim, let's do some good deeds. Yes? Bruns, who did not understand the reason or circumstance, tilted his head in confusion, but kept his mouth shut when he saw Callius' face break into an eerie smile. A month later, near the north. The Snowy Mountains. An impressive colony consisting of wooden fences and log cabins was nestled in the middle of the mountains. It was a haven for infamous bandits. It was cold and covered in snow, so cold that breath steamed in the air, and easy to get lost in the white frozen landscape. The Snowy Mountain, Anavati. A notorious bandit group resided there. The Double Axe Bandits. The leader of the bandit group, Yermody, had been resting heavily drunk despite it being broad daylight. He was roused at the call of a subordinate. Boss! Boss! What the hell, it's too early in the morning. It's broad daylight, wake up, boss. Something big has happened. What the heck, my head hurts, so stop yelling. I'm dying. As he laid his hand on the double axe by his side, his subordinate's voice became uneasy. You know those kids next door? Those bloody bandits or whatever. Why are they invading our territory again? Do they want another kicking? No. No, they're all dead. Huh. All? Yes. How? No, well, I don't know. It's not just them. Bloody, callous, and the fruit bandits all died. All of them? That's right. All the bandits in the area were annihilated. When he heard that they all died from an unknown cause, Yermody, the leader of the double axe bandits, was also very confused. Did the royal army invade or something? Or is it the church? What the hell? No, why would you suddenly annihilate us bandits after leaving us alone for so long? What did we do wrong? We're just innocents. Ah, uh, we're not innocents, boss. Oh, that's right. Bullying the villagers, taking their food, stealing, robbing money, kidnapping women, come to think of it, those evil things, they'd done them all. Kwong. The leader was scratching his head in embarrassment, but at this time the outside became noisy. The snowy mountain, Anavati. A man with a red cloak and two swords suddenly appeared at the stronghold of the double axe bandits. What? Who opened the gate? We didn't open the gate. He broke down the fence and came in. What? What nonsense? Since the snowy mountain was a place where wild beasts ran rampant, the sturdy fence was kept repaired and didn't leave a hole for even a mouse to get in. There was no way it could be destroyed by mere human power. That was then. Puhak! What the fuck? Suddenly, the uninvited guest drew his sword and began to cut down the bandits. Come on, catch him. No, kill him. What are you doing standing around? The bandit leader, Yermody, shouted like an enraged whale. The bandits all pulled out their double axes and rushed at the sword-wielding visitor. The double axe bandits were quite famous and the largest bandit group in the area. Thanks to this, the number of available personnel exceeded a hundred, and even included mercenaries with diverse backgrounds in their ranks. If one counted the number of people, it was more than one hundred. Besides, it was a group of talented people, not a bunch of random thugs. The bandit boss, Yermody, snorted and folded his arms. He didn't know what kind of madman this guy was, but soon he would kneel before him drenched in blood, and that's all that mattered. But after a while, 
About a minute later, Yermidi unfolded his arms. After five minutes, his complexion became pale. Ten minutes later, he unwittingly grabbed the double axe that hung at his back. Fuck. Ten minutes. After only ten minutes, the place became quiet. This wasn't just an idiomatic expression. The bandits were all really dead. Hundreds of corpses piled up like a mountain on the field, and in front of them stood a single swordsman with a fluttering red cloak. His swordsmanship was smooth and beautiful, but there was no mercy in it. The bandit boss saw the rosary hanging from the visitor's neck. He was a pilgrim. He was a pilgrim of the sword, called by the gods. Why? Why are you doing this to me? Just go look for your sword, you crazy guy. He shouted in anger, but the bandit leader soon regretted his words. And that regret was accompanied by his death. After a while, the pilgrim could be heard mumbling, standing where the bandit chief's head had fallen. Not enough. Predator sword, Lowe's. Grade, life sword. Inhabited soul, a mixed soul. Unique ability, predation. Predation count, 494. But since I got this many. Now, I just need to catch some beasts to reach 500. The pilgrim's name was Callius. He was feeding blood to the predator sword, Lowe's. In order to raise the level of the predator sword, it was necessary to feed it moderately with the blood of monsters and humans. So, while heading north for the past month, Callius slaughtered the bandits who hid under Carpe's eyes. Because the northern part of the kingdom was always barren and the snow was so heavy that it was out of reach of the kingdom army, many criminal groups hid there. It was along the road north anyway. So on the way, Callius found the famous bandits and wiped them all out cleanly. After all, they were like cancer for society, so he had no reluctance in killing them. The circumstances of each individual who became a bandit. If you can't wield your sword because you care about something like that, it's better to put it down and become an alchemist. Pant. Pant. Master. I'm here too. Please don't just leave me behind. Bruns. Callius clicked his tongue and put the predator sword back into its sheath. It was dripping with blood, but there was no need to wipe it off. It'll devour it anyway. I thought you had a little bit of stamina when we started traveling. Is this your first time in the north? BRR, it's my first time in the northern areas. Master. It's also because the bag is heavy. Hmm. Lately, I've gained a lot from wiping out the bandits. Because the grateful villagers gave food as thanks, and gold coins and riches came from the bandits' dens. The bag called, Eldora's Cloth Bag, an artifact purchased from Tristar, couldn't handle the weight, so Bruns had to climb the mountain with a fairly heavy burden. About a hundred kilos or so. That's why Brun's physique had improved a lot. The upper as well as lower body muscles had been torn and rebuilt, and it became a body that was worth seeing. Honestly, I thought he'd run away by now. For a neighborhood bully from the city, he had quite a bit of guts. Where are you going? To check out the place. A place this size should be full of gold coins and wealth. You can't just throw it all away. But it'd be heavy. The bag would become heavier. Even if I die early, I have to die with money. Although it was very different from when I first saw him on Tristar. There's no change when in front of money. Now, or then. When gold coins were on the line, he was still the same. Callius, who was quietly waiting for Bruns to organize his thoughts, drew his sword again. Did they smell the blood? They were the beasts of the snowy mountains. Also, the north was the north after all. Even in these mountains, as if it was natural, there were magical beasts. First was a snow leopard, white as snow. Of course, the stature was larger than the average snow leopard, and it had much sharper claws. It's good. It was time to feed the magic beast's blood to his sword. Since they approached him by themselves, he could only feel grateful. 
once again, Callius Predator Sword was swung indiscriminately. 1, 2, 10. Even with the increasing number of corpses, strangely, the magic beasts did not fall back. It's a bit terrifying. Callius looked at the Predator Sword, Lowe's. Lowe's, pulsing with a terrifying anticipation, was devouring the blood of the demonic beasts on its blade. It's like a demon sword. This ominous sword was probably attracting the magical beasts somehow. Callius cut and cut, avoiding the claws and teeth of the onrushing magic beasts. And after a while. Master. I think you should come over here. Eek! Bruns ran out from a cabin somewhere and was startled. It was because next to the corpses of bandits, another mountain made up of corpses of large magic beasts had formed. No, in a few moments, you've became covered in blood. What's going on? Callius, who was drenched in blood, wiped his face with, twilight cloak, and approached bronze. There's someone here, I think you should take a look. What's all the fuss about? That is. Callius followed Bruns into the bandit's cabin. It was actually a prison, holding several women who appeared to be servants, and one child. A noble? The child was wearing clothes made of a luxurious fabric and looked like the descendant of an aristocrat. Callius, who had no interest, tried to rebuke Bruns for calling him for something like this, but after a moment, he looked back at the noble child, startled black hair that seemed to be part of the dark night, and gray eyes that looked like they were not of a human. The attendants trembled when they saw the blood-drenched form of Callius, but the noble child was looking at him with both eyes clear and open, as if completely without fear. You, what's your name? When asked, the child got up from the seat with bright eyes and said confidently, Emily, Emily von Gervain. A little child descended from the great noble family of the North. The family that rules supreme in the North. The same family as Callius, a famous family of swordsmen. She was a noble child who had inherited the blood of Gervain. Chapter 20 Rumble, rumble. Inside a carriage that was remodeled from a dog sled to run on the snow. Callius sat and looked at the girl facing him the same hair color as him. The same eyes. Emily von Gervain. The two looked at each other curiously. The two attendants accompanying Emily were murmuring and mumbling about Callius. Bruns was a little dissatisfied with the situation. After leaving the mountain and reaching the nearby village, they got a wagon, loaded it with their spoils, and headed north. And now, half a day has passed. Callius and Emily kept looking at each other without uttering a word. There was no one in the Carpe Kingdom who did not know Gervain of the North. Black hair. And gray eyes. Callius and Emily are both from the same family. There's no way that master was married, so maybe it's like a cousin. Emily's attendants seem to think so, too. K.H.M. Here, Callius' servant and friend of the heart must step forward. Ah, let me introduce my master. An imposing pilgrim who worships the great god Valphorus. That was then. Emily's cute voice cut off Brun's words, piercing to the heart of the matter. Gervain's scapegrace. Hook! Brun's, as well as the attendants, were startled and swallowed their breath. A dull man who has never had a talent for swordsmanship since he was a child. One who has an arrogant attitude as if looking down on and educating others, even though his own head is empty. Addicted to sensual pleasures and debauchery, so he often wastes his wealth. A rare piece of garbage. Bruns blinked. Aside from the authenticity of the words poured out in rapid fire, he was confused as to whether it was real or not that a child as cute as a doll really uttered those words. He rubbed his ears once to check if he had heard it wrong but there were far too many words in that tirade for him to have somehow misheard. Bruns gulped. The Callius he knew was a pilgrim with no mercy in his actions. A man among men who had no hesitation when drawing a sword, one who always put his life on the line when it comes to fighting. 
to say that he has no talent in swordsmanship. He didn't understand. Bruns glanced at his master, Callius. Despite the child's degrading remarks, his face was calm. Emily. How did you know I was Gervain's scapegrace? Gervain's direct descendants, as well as the people from the collateral branches are all busy subjugating the White Forest in the north right now. Emily pointed a finger at Callius' neck and then at the back of his hand. Add to that the rosary around your neck and the stigma on your hand. I heard that you are the only one with Gervain's blood who is a pilgrim. You, the scapegrace. You're smart. Unlike you. PSHK. Callius grinned. She was only a little over twelve years old. She was far more bright and nimble than you would expect from her age. But after all, she was a child of Gervain. If you inherited Gervain's blood, you should indeed be like this. Because that is befitting the name of Gervain praised by the masses. Gervain. I came to the north to meet Bernard, but I didn't expect to meet somebody from Gervain before that. Then why were you captured by bandits? I don't want to tell you. Quite hostile. She'd probably heard the rumors and stories about himself from others in the family. Yeah. Callius, the scapegrace of Gervain, who did not cover his family in glory, but rather painted its name with dung. Even a small child won't have a good opinion about him if she has heard stories about him from an early age. That's why I didn't want to meet anybody from the family. There is no reason to meet, and there is no good outcome even if you meet. The relationship between Gervain and Callius is tangled like a knot. One that is better to cut than to untie. For this reason, Callius has never set foot on the Gervain estate in the three years since he became a pilgrim. But whose child is Emily? I have no memory of setting this up. If it was the direct line, I would have known. At a guess, maybe a child from a collateral branch. It doesn't really matter. It's pretty interesting, but Callius' current goal is the spirit sword owner, Bernard of Gervain. Still, she's like a niece, so let's just take her home. Moreover, since she got captured by bandits, he felt a little anxious. She looks smart on the outside, but how did she get captured by a bandit group, of all things? He was curious. Emily. Don't talk to me like you're my friend. You idiot. How are you with the sword? Better than you. Then how come you got captured? I don't want to talk about it. Maybe you don't have any talent? That's not it. Don't slander the family name by saying things you don't understand. She then kept her mouth shut, saying it was meaningless to explain. I don't think it's some kind of great story, though. It's a great secret that you can't understand. If it's just being caught by the bandits, what kind of great story can be behind that? The story became uninteresting from the moment those two-bit bandits got involved. One who has the blood of Gervain. Captured by roadside bandits. Callius noticed Emily giving him a venomous stare. Is your divine blood, sacred orifice, one, blocked? Hearing that, Emily's hands curled into fists. That seems to be the correct answer. Some ancient noble lineages, including Gervain, have their own characteristics. It is the result of divine baptism from the time of the kingdom's founding. That is why the royal family and some founding families have unusually colored eyes or hair, or have stigmas somewhere on their body. Therefore, members of those families can have divine power even without being baptized. Of course, the same is true for Gervain. Their gray eyes contain the traces of God. Therefore, Gervain are born with divine power and handle the sword relatively easily. But Emily's divine power is too light. It's not that there's no divine power at all, but it feels strangely fragile. Just like when Callius was wearing Vivi's bracelet, Emily's presence felt quite light. But there's no way a child like this could have such an artifact. It is reasonable to assume that the sacred orifice, the channel through which divine power flows, is blocked. Did you have an accident? Or was it intentional? 
Emily shut her mouth. Large tear droplets hung sadly from the corners of her eyes. She was desperately trying to hold back her tears. Seeing Emily look down at the floor like that, Callius turned to look at the scenery outside the carriage. You must have a story that you can't tell me. He was a little curious, but didn't ask further. He didn't want to talk much, nor did he want to listen to Gervain's situation. After all, it was just a short-lived friendship. One that would soon come to an end. So there was no point in worrying. Their journey continued for three days. The wagon finally arrived at the Gervain family's territory. Straight ahead they could see the town built on a huge piece of land, and the castle standing majestic at the end. Javarsh Castle, the ancestral home of the Gervain family. Then, let's part here. Callius immediately said his farewells to Emily. Emily also snorted and turned her back, and started trudging towards the castle. You don't want to go? Emily and her attendants were making their way to the castle through the rough snow. The castle was perched on top of a steep cliff, with sturdy walls and high battlements. Javarsh Castle was nothing less than a natural fortress, and it was where Emily von Gervain should have been instead of running around outside. It's the Gervain family's estate. They'll recognize me, and that's not going to end up anywhere good. We're running out of food, and we have some things to sell. You're being noisy. The people of the North treat the Gervain bloodline with utmost respect. Gervain is the shield of the North, so it is impossible that the locals would not recognize a Gervain on sight. Therefore, it was difficult for Callius to enter the Gervain estate. Because the news would quickly reach the family once the locals recognize and greet him. There's nothing good about having the local scapegrace wander around the place. It's considered fortunate if nobody waves a knife at you and scolds you to get the hell out of there. Let's go. What is urgent now is not Emily's existence, but the spirit sword owner, Bernard. But what kind of person is this Bernard whom we need to find? The corners of Callius' lips twitched at Brun's question. His eyes became sharp, and his hands brushed the hilt of the sword hanging at his waist. That damned old man. Javarsh Fortress. Kello look. Thick chains rattled as the enormous gates slowly opened. Kugagum. A child and two attendants could be seen entering. Black hair and gray eyes. A girl with neat short hair and a prominent headdress. It was Emily von Gervain. As soon as the gates opened, Emily walked in and hurried towards the chapel. Opening the door, there was an old man with gray hair, drinking alcohol in front of the statue of Valtherus. Oh, this is the holy water. His face was flushed as if he was completely drunk, and alcohol was dripping down his white beard. If he was pretending to be a priest, he didn't give off the impression of a very good one. Grandpa. Do you know where I just came back from? Huh? Who are you? It's Emily. Emily. Don't you even remember me anymore? Ah, Emily, my sweet granddaughter. No, I'm not grandpa's granddaughter, I'm more like your grandniece. But where were you? The servants were looking all over for you because you disappeared. Emily sat down on one side of the chapel with a prickly face. I went and raised my sword against the bandits. Then I got caught. Oh. Why did you do such a reckless thing? I told you it was too early for you. I've never killed anyone. Albert said, you have to kill to become a true knight. Then my divine blood could get unblocked. The priest looked at Emily with pity and patted her shoulder. But how did you escape? Somebody helped me. Oh, may be blessed. Who is it? I need to give him my thanks. It's someone Grandpa knows. Um? Somebody I know? Gilbert? No, he's on the front line right now. Then Charlie? No, he's away hunting magic beasts in the White Forest. Who could it be? Gervain's scapegrace. The drunken priest's eyes narrowed. Hey! That bastard, he saved me. 
How is he? He's handsome. He called me smart. But he wasn't vulgar, right? Yeah, just like Grandpa said. Ha ha ha. The priest, laughing happily, touched the hilt of the sword hanging from his waist. Callius. So he's back. His name was Bernard. A paladin, who had found his own sword after a long pilgrimage. Chapter 21 Little by little The glass shards under their feet brightened up in the reflected torchlight. The air was full of the putrid smell of carrion. In that musty underground area was a messy, shambolic laboratory. The Iron Grace Heretic Inquisitor, Ryburn, narrowed his brows as he put on his glasses. Leader. Take a look at this. Hmm. It had been a long time since last he had to pursue after an apostate. The apostate who cleverly escaped his search network had passed through this underground laboratory. It was a terrible place where biological experiments had been conducted, unbridled. It seems that all the related specimens are dead. Of course. There were also some signs of battle. Although some time had passed, it wasn't difficult to infer what had happened. The heretic who broke the church's taboo and the apostate who hid the holy relic. It's an obvious combination. The heretic researcher couldn't have built a lab like this by himself. It was clear that he had a helper, and that must have been the apostate. Callius. It could be concluded that he had been the researcher's associate. There must have been some quarrel between them. These people are demented heretics. A breach can easily occur between such people, since their cooperation is solely based on personal gain. And if that's not why, they might have coveted and tried to monopolize the power of the relic. Del Ruin, standing next to Ryburn, nodded his head and folded his arms, agreeing that it seemed a very plausible motive. But will this be all right? What do you mean? Didn't you see the traces of the battle between Pilgrimester and Callius? Ryburn fell silent. He had indeed seen it. The traces left from their battle. In the middle of those tangled woods. And at the end of it, a sharp and striking sword mark. A deep indentation, as if a dragon had scratched the ground with its claw. I heard Pilgrimester told you something. She said that she had been defeated. And that Callius is not an apostate, nor does he have any relics. It didn't make sense however many times you heard it. Ryburn snorted. If that fool didn't have the power of the relic, how could Esther, the next saint of the church and a genius among geniuses, be defeated by a mere three years of practice? Didn't you say that Pilgrim Esther was not injured anywhere? Yes, I'm a little skeptical about that. Seeing Ryburn's sharpening eyes, Del Ruin fell into silence. After we uncover all Callius' sins, we may have to go find Pilgrim Esther. Yes. What he did after visiting this underground laboratory was unknown. Even if Esther's words were true, there was a lot of ambiguity in his story. There was no reason why the Iron Grace Inquisitor, Ryburn, should stop. He is heading north. Yes, the scouts have reported that there are rumors of a pilgrim who cleared out all the nearby bandits. Inquisitor Del Ruin. Yes, sir. Send a message to the church. What? Pilgrim Callius. He had a holy relic, which allowed a continuous and explosive growth. The extent of his growth could not be estimated by Ryburn, and it was still in progress. It was self evident that if left as it was, he would become an uncontrollable monster. In addition, now that the circumstances of his deep involvement with an alchemist engaged in taboo research had come into light, he could not be left alone any longer. I speak in the name of Ryburn, the leader of the Inquisition. I am raising the danger level of Pilgrim Callius from level 5 to level 2, and I request active support from the Church. A request for active support. I am requesting support from five of the seven inquisitorial platoons leaving out the first and the second. The purpose is the apostate Callius. His life, his relics. Anne. 
Ryburn looked at the largest broken glass tube at the end of the lab. The results of the research that violated the taboo. Seize it all. Whying. The bone-chilling eastern wind blew through the north and cut deep into the white forest. The man, who was wearing a thick hood, suddenly raised his head and let out a deep breath. The long white stream of his breath fluttered in the wind and dispersed. White Forest A notorious high-risk area, even by the standards of the north. Grotesquely gigantic trees tower high in the sky, right in front of those who guarded its borders. A forest made up of such trees. That is the northern white forest. Each tree is wider than a house, and tall enough to block the sun and they fill the uppermost edges of the northern parts of the kingdom. From a distance one might be able to feel the magnificence of nature, and call it a superb view, but its neighbors do not. Life is a comedy from afar, and a tragedy from up close. It is the same for the northern white forest. To match the vast size of the forest, the magic beasts inhabiting it are similarly huge. Besides, they are more ferocious and more vicious than their kin from other places. Of course, there are a lot of territorial disputes between the beasts, and a lot of them move in herds, so hunting in the forest is not easy. There are many beasts that perceive the nearby humans as prey and wander across the forest's borders. The number of knights who enter the white forest every year to hunt but are instead hunted down by their prey is also considerable. One might wonder, why is no effort made to cut down all the trees? No matter how big a tree is, it can be cut down. If the trees go through logging for several generations, there would be no such thing left as the white forest, and there would be nothing to fear about the ferocious magic beasts breeding inside it. But those are the words of those who have never seen the white forest properly. Most of the trees in the white forest are silicified wood, which in simple words means a tree that is hardened into stone. How do you cut down a giant tree that has turned to stone? It can't be cut. If it's a paladin, he might be able to cut one down somehow over a few days. But how much time will it take for all the silicified trees in the white forest to be cut down? Who would be able to do all that messy work? Do those who have worked hard to rise to the position of a paladin, want to cut down trees hard as stone for the rest of their lives? That's just nonsense. Therefore, it is Gervain's mission to lead knights and soldiers to hunt the magic beasts inside the forest. Even if you can't cut down the trees, nor burn down the forest, nor destroy the demonic beast's root and branch, even so, in the north, Gervain still stands. It's cold. The man standing in the center of the white forest felt a little nostalgia and boredom when he saw the sword marks on the solicified wood. Three years ago, Callius had been here. Immediately after gaining the status of a pilgrim, he almost died while wandering around without knowing where to go. After organizing his thoughts, he made up his mind to train his body, so he went to the white forest. No, to be precise he set out to find him in the white forest. But why isn't he here? He'd always been here. Although he was a paladin who had completed his pilgrimage, he was a strange old man who hunted magic beasts in the white forest instead of returning to the church. Bernard. A pilgrim who'd completed his pilgrimage, one who possessed the thunderbolt sword, Rockin, and had completed the achievement of turning his rosary into a sheath. An appointed paladin, a hunter who never left the north and only hunted the magic beasts dwelling in the white forest. Callius had visited him here three years ago. Um. You. Who are you? One does not simply walk into the white forest. The pattern engraved on the speaker's chest was a combination of a gray wolf and a sword. It was a pattern that symbolized Gervain. A knight of Gervain? However, there was no gray in her eyes, and seeing that only a little divine power could be felt, she was a knight who had been baptized. But she was holding a carcass. A sword close to a life sword. Can't you hear me talking? Chang. The speaker and the knights who followed her drew their swords as one. The knight's eyes were valiant and their postures dauntless. 
probably because they were knights of the north, their spirit itself was different from the knights of other places. Such spirit and momentum seeped through the skin and made the blood boil. But Callius did not draw his sword in response. He looked at them for a moment, sighed, and pulled his head back. Ah! The knight captain, giving a small sigh, bowed her head. Immediately, the attitude changed. The stiff neck of the knight captain, who had been trying to interrogate him with an overbearing attitude, bended down at once. It was a transformation that highlighted just how great was Gervain's status in the north. I see you are a Gervain. Callius nodded disapprovingly and put his head back on. He didn't want to show himself, but it was still better than having a pointless sword fight. He was not afraid to fight the knights, but Callius wasn't a murderer. He wanted to avoid any fights, and if he shed blood here, the magic beasts of the White Forest would come rushing in droves. Besides, there was nothing good about killing Gervain's knights. All right then. But, the moment he was about to pass by. Hey, hey! Callius' footsteps stopped at the knight's urgent voice. Isn't it Master Callius? Looking at him without saying a word, the knight captain's eyes filled with certainty. I must be right. So you know me. You don't recognize me? She frowned as at that, then gave a little laugh and took off her helmet. I'm Orphan, who stood by young master when you were young. Orphan Deliophan. Orphan Deliophan. The lady who introduced herself like that seemed to be happy and burst into laughter. I don't know her. Seeing her talking about his childhood, it was a memory the current Callius had no knowledge of. You have grown up. Judging by the way she treated him and her words, she seemed to have been a knight in charge of escorting Callius when he was young. It's the first I've heard of her name. It doesn't look like she's an important character. But it's an odd name. If you're even a little familiar, you'd know, but that's not the case at all. We were on patrol. This is a coincidence, but would you like to join me for a while? Sure. You guys wait here. All right. Wang. Buduk. Puduk. Callius and Orphan, who were walking across the white forest through the crunching snow, were talking. Is that so, the Lord has adopted him. Gervain's main family line. The current children of the patriarch were one son and one daughter. One of them was Callius. The only son of the patriarch was an idiot and one who was even almost expelled from the family, so he needed a new son. Yes. He is not only good at swordsmanship, but he is also excellent in other various fields. Everyone thinks that he will probably succeed him soon. Well. Oh, I made a slip of the tongue. No, no problem. I'm too busy with my life, so who cares? I'm not interested in the first place. It's not some ordinary family, it's Gervain. An area that can fall into danger at any time, not only by threats from the White Forest, but also while defending the vast territory and its borders. Besides, feeding the numerous residents and their dependents living here is not something just anyone can do. It's a daunting task just to protect yourself. I am not a fool, greedy for the job of a caretaker of a barren field. Cheek. Orphan, who suddenly stopped walking, looked at her sword with eyes wet with falling snow. Do you remember? No, I don't remember. Callius was starting to find it difficult to persist against the knight's slow and long-running welcome. It was a waste of time, and he had no interest in listening to stories from the past that he couldn't even remember. He needed to find Bernard quickly. She seemed to have something she wanted to say but all this hesitation was just frustrating. When you were young, young master asked me to practice swordsmanship. Is that so? At that time, young master lost your wooden sword against my sword and became angry. Where is the story going? It seems that the escort knight had been tormented quite a bit. You said this while kicking my shin. Just because you became a knight somehow by swinging your sword, do you think you've become an aristocrat? Is that so? Shrum. 
Orphan's sword, slowly drawn out, showed off its colored edge. I thought she wanted to say something, but looked like she wanted to do something instead. And then, you kept beating me as hard you could with your wooden sword. If I resisted, you said you'd accuse me of striking at my master, and have me kicked out as an honorless knight. Sadness and regret could be seen in her bitter smile. To spit such disgrace on a knight who lives for honor and dies for honor. After all, a scapegrace is a scapegrace. This must also be fate. Since you became a pilgrim of the order and left Gervain's name behind. My sword is only going to cut through a savage nameless bastard encountered outside the border. Isn't that God's will? Callius' eyebrows twitched. Callius. A fool like you is not supposed to come back to the north. A sword brimming with old grudges that he had no memory of was directed at him. Callius let out a deep sigh as he looked at Orphan's sword. That's why I didn't like coming to the north. Callius. Pull out your sword. It's embarrassing, but what can I do? If I have to pull it out, I just have to pull it out. Shrung, cheek. He grabbed, predator sword, Lowe's, and started pulling it out, put it back in, and pulled out life sword, loosen instead. You have no talent in swordsmanship, and yet you carry a good sword. Isn't that throwing pearls before swine? I see. I thought it would be a little different because you became a pilgrim. But seeing how the divine power flowing through you was thin like a rat's tail, as expected, you have achieved nothing. It's amazing that you're still alive. It's just that my honor has been tarnished by a trivial thing like you. Come. I'll give you a chance, for old time's sake. Is that so? Callius raised his sword, looked at it and murmured. Thank you. And, immediately, Callius' sword struck like a lightning bolt. Chapter 22 Orphan Deliophon A Night Searching for Honor and Glory Like most of the children in Carpe, she grew up listening to the prestigious tales of the Gervain family. So, after she became a knight, she naturally came and knocked on their door. Since she was a promising knight despite being born a woman, she did not face any obstacles and soon was able to make an oath of allegiance and dedicate her sword to Gervain. That she would gladly give her life to the north, and in the name of Gervain. Thus, she swore and committed. But the north was harsh. Magic beasts flocking in incessantly, and enemies looking for the slightest weakness. Yet, that only made the task more honorable. Her cause was to protect Gervain, and thus contribute to the protection of the kingdom itself. A sense of pride burned in a corner of her heart. Even though I was born as a woman, I decided to live as a knight. What cause could I fight for more honorable than this? She was content with her choice. Of course, until she met the scapegrace of Gervain. Until she met Callius. Kook. Chiang, Chang. Kugagugugu. Rattle. It's heavy. Only one strike, yet the weight of that one strike was unusual. Her hand trembled and her sword shook. Her gauntlets were quickly soaked with blood from her torn palms. Tuck, tuck. Red droplets fell and seeped into the frozen snow. Ha, ah, ah. ha. Cold air streamed into the lungs. But in contrast, the whole body burned with heat and sweat. Who? She'd heard rumors that he became a pilgrim so she had some hopes for his success. But Orphan was greatly disappointed as soon as she saw Callius. The quality of his spiritual power as well as the visible momentum were so lacking as to be called insignificant. No matter even if he became a pilgrim, Callius remained Callius. A scapegrace rarely seen. A pile of useless filth. Him just being alive was almost sinful. Even still, she sighed. She still sympathized. Because he was still useless. So, she brought up the old story. If you show any regrets. If you say you're sorry, if you apologize. She decided to forgive him by saying it was alright, since he'd been young. Even if he'd tarnished her honor, 
wasn't it just the folly of childhood? I still carry that old memory, but if you apologize sincerely, I'll forgive you. However, he was indifferent about the past. He didn't even care to listen, as if he didn't even remember. Although she decided to forgive him, it's true that her heart still felt burdened and laden. So, now she was reassured. He still remained an incorrigible piece of garbage, and that's how Orphan liked it. So, she drew her sword. But why? Kang! How? How could he wield such a heavy sword, when his level of divine power is no better than Ant? Orphan couldn't understand. Her long-ago master was holding his sword in front of her with an expressionless face. Callius von Gervain. She doubted whether he was truly the person he knew. Different. There were differences compared to the one in her memory. He no longer looked like an immature nobleman who couldn't even hold the sword properly. Sharp eyes. An emotionless face. A terribly indifferent expression. So Orphan was outraged. She felt as if she'd been completely ignored. As if her opponent didn't have any attention to spend on her. Even though, between the two of them, she had launched the bigger share of attacks. However, her opponent's sword steadily received her attacks, and used that power to counter with a stronger force. Kang! Obviously, she stabbed the sword straight towards him each time, but the sword's tip always ended up deviating to either look up at the sky or look down at the ground. The fight she's assumed would be over in a few strikes now inched closer to dozens, or hundreds. Ha, ha, ha. Her muscles were weary, her heart felt like it was about to burst, and beads of sweat streamed down her face. Her rapid breaths steamed white in the air but the idiot in front of her was just staring back at her with his still, gray eyes. Puff. Anger filled her throat. Eh. She squeezed out all of her power in reserve, and concentrated her divine power on her sword. Sword energy rose off the blade like light and fluttered above the knee-deep snow. If it's this. If it's this, it will definitely be able to cross the gap between us and touch him. Hoon. But, then, Wai Ching, the silver sword that appeared only for a moment filled her eyes with its dazzling light. Wai Ik, P-U-K. The sword left her hand and dropped to the ground. Between the two, the torn and shredded sword energies fluttered like petals in the air. Ah! The petals of sword energy danced in the air. The broken silver petals were transcendently beautiful in the sunlight. Orphan, realizing that she was kneeling on the snow, let out a laugh. In front of her, those ruthless gray pupils of Callius appeared again. A complete defeat. It was Orphan's defeat, and an inexcusable one. Kill me. Orphan bowed her exposed neck, defenseless. Shrom. Callius' sword pointed towards Orphan. The premonition of death covered her like a shadow. However, Chwak! She startled. It was an orphan that Callius cut. It was a giant white sand snake. The head of the giant reptile, itself the length of a larger than average snake, rolled in the snow. They seemed to be flocking here because of the smell of blood. Callius, who put Lucin back on his waist, calmly started to quickly walk away. You're just leaving like this. Without ending it. Are you going to tarnish my honor again? Orphan screamed, but the response made her dazed. It was just a practice duel. Do you have to take your opponent's life after a practice duel? Saying that, Callius quietly disappeared into the white forest somewhere. Orphan, who was looking at his trail with a blank face, finally got up and grabbed her sword. Just a practice duel, huh? Smiling bitterly, she soon went back to join the knights who had come to find her. Did he leave? Yes. What did you do? You don't look very good, Captain. It's nothing. Just. A practice duel, a quick one. Various emotions appeared and disappeared on Orphan's face. 
However, that swordsmanship did not leave her mind. That much skill. Did he hide it before? The confused orphans soon led the knights back to Javarsh Castle. A dark night. After spending a day and a half hunting the magic beasts inside the White Forest, Callius arrived at a small inn near the border. He'd looked for Bernard, but couldn't find him. And met Orphan instead. Z z z z z z. Snores vibrated even outside the house. Bump. When he opened the door, Bronze could be seen sleeping on the bed, snoring. Callius' eyes grew cold. The White Forest was a pretty dangerous place, so he told Bronze to rest here since bringing him along would be bothersome. But seeing him rest so comfortably, he didn't feel good at all. The master came back from a bloody fight with the magic beasts in the White Forest under a raging blizzard, and the servant was sleeping so comfortably. With a full stomach, no less. Bruns. Callius called in a heavy voice. However, there was not even a twitch in response. Rather, Bruns only snored louder, as if asserting even more excitedly that he was asleep. Callius' patience had by now reached its limit. He immediately launched a kick towards Bruns who was still lying on the bed. P.U.K. Bump. Ugh. Which bastard? Bruns woke up and screamed in surprise, but all he saw was Callius, with snow piled up on his head and shoulders. Oh my gosh, you're back! Bruns immediately bowed his head. Callius' eyes were so cold that they seemed to tear into his skin. Bruns arched his back even lower and stepped aside. Why is there only one bed? Ah, oh, that. That's, um. Because there is only one room here. It's a small place near the border, what do you mean there's no room? How come there's only one room left empty? In response to the question, Bruns scratched the back of his head as if he also didn't understand the reason. Ah, yes. I also asked because it was strange. They said it's because tomorrow is a day for hunting. Hunting? Tias. Callius sat on the bed and stroked his chin, deep in thought. I see. Now seems to be that time. Do you know? It's not a big deal. Probably because the breeding season is approaching. The breeding season of the magic beasts inside the forest. Giving birth requires a lot of nutrition, and for the magic beasts the main nutritional supplement happened to be eating humans. Hunting therefore referred to a large-scale hunt for the magic beasts by leading a large army of soldiers into the White Forest, to ensure that no beasts came out and attacked the civilians. I guess night errants are coming from all over, so there are no rooms left. Night errants who have ambiguous origins or single-mindedly pursue honor, usually set their sights on the north as their destination. However, Gervain is not a family that just anyone can enter because it stands so high even among the families known for their swordsmanship. So, they hold a hunting contest. For the Gervain family, in any case, there were more benefits than losses. Would you like to eat? Considering how much Master eats. I'll eat at the restaurant. Are they ready? Yeah, I've put a word in advance. Then let's go. Yes. I'll guide you. Is there a need to guide? It was just a three-story inn. It wasn't that big place, you could just go down to the first floor and you'd find the restaurant. My master is here, like I told you before, bring the food. Ah, I'll prepare it for you. Since it was an inn in the north. The owner didn't give off a normal impression either. Although he was bald, the scars on his face and the well-forged arm muscles looked quite impressive. Callius sat down, glancing once at those who were already eating in the dining room. It's annoying. Most of the people here were knights, come to participate in the hunting competition. So, they fought with each other. With his hood on, the others couldn't see the color of his hair and eyes, so they thought he was also a knight to compete with. He was getting tired for nothing because the knights showed off their spirit inside the small restaurant. They're not knights, they're thugs. 
the aura seemed to be lingering. I can see what you're doing. Oh, there's our meal. Not bad. Bruns knew Callius' appetite well, as he'd seen him eat from up close. The restaurant owner placed dozens of large plates on the table. On the plate, a variety of generous amounts of meat were arranged by portion. And then the main dish. Quan. At the center of the table, an unknown beast, roasted whole. Our famous northern dish, grilled earth dragon. Oh, oh. Well. I was worried about the food as it was a fairly small inn, but I was mistaken. An earth dragon. Although it's not a real dragon, but more like a lizard. Callius lips curved. Immediately, he picked up his fork and knife, and cut off the hind legs of the grilled earth dragon. The juices splattered inside his mouth. The legs had a lot of muscle so he thought the meat might be tough or stringy, but that was not the case at all. Rather, it was chewy, and the seasonings and the sauce permeated deeply into the cut, so it tasted like pork feet. Not bad. Callius kept elegantly slicing the roasted earth dragon with a knife. But, brothers, can you eat all of this? I hate my food being left over. What do you think of my lord? Someone who eats like he's carrying a wagon in his stomach. We can even order more, so please relax, master. Bruns. Yes, master. Would you like more? Is it better to rip off your mouth or pluck out your tongue? It's your choice. I choose to keep my mouth shut. The innkeeper chuckled. I'm sorry, but please be patient. I just ran out of ingredients. This is enough. Then I'm glad. Ha <laughs> ha. The owner smiled happily and headed back to the lobby. Kikig. Master, one meal. It was a guest. A man with a big sword on his back. At a glance, he was a strong man, and looking at the traces on his armor, one could tell that he was quite a belligerent one. I'm sorry, but dinner is over. Then what is that? That was the last. Unfortunately, you're one step late. I want to give you a meal, but I can't make any more because I'm out of ingredients. The owner said it was a pity, but he didn't look very sad. The man's eyes turned to Callius and the others, who were eating so sumptuously the table legs creaked under the weight of food. Cheek, cheek. Keekig. Every time he took a step, the wooden floorboard groaned and squeaked. Tias. Hey, you. Can't you see my master is eating? Servants should stay out of this. What? P.U.K. The knight's fist split the air. Cook! Kudong! Bronze collapsed, smashing against the table, and didn't look like he could get up. However, Callius, who was still eating the earth dragon, did not care. He had gracefully eaten up the flesh of the hind legs with his knife and fork, and now remained the forelegs, as well as the special parts of the grilled earth dragon, the neck and the breast. And last but not the least, the cheek, the most special part of a roasted earth dragon. It was the part he was most looking forward to. Since I'm so hungry. If possible, let's eat together. You do do duck. The man immediately ripped off the earth dragon's head with his hand and began to chew it whole. Callius fork stopped. Oh, owner. The workmanship is quite good. How delicious is this? Especially, yo, these cheeks are amazing. The eyes that looked at him were full of life. The giant knight seemed to have fallen in love with the taste of the roasted earth dragon, so he spread his hand out again after eating the head whole. He was moving to tear off a foreleg. Then Callius' fork flew through the air. P.U.K. Cook! The fork pierced the back of the knight's hand. Hey, you crazy bastard! If you want to die, pull it out. Your neck will fly off the moment you pull it out. The knight's throat bobbed high and low under the gaze of those eerily cool pupils. He couldn't pull out the fork or hold his sword, so for a moment he could only look at his hand on the table awkwardly. 
but the pain made him soon forget the fear. You motherfucker. Pock. He pulled out the fork, threw it away, and reached out to the sword behind his back. But Callius was one step faster. The knife he was holding in his hand moved. Cholkon. The knight's armor fell off. The man was taken aback for a moment, and froze with his hand on the handle of the sword behind his back. Callius had tried to cut the knight's head off with a knife, but he couldn't. He could only cut the seams of the armor, so the huge armor the knight had been wearing fell to the floor. The cause was that an old man pulling his arm from behind him. Tias. The half-naked knight now had cold sweat dripping down from the tip of his chin. Kaha, that hair-trigger temper is still there, I see. Ooh, what a laugh. This old man's throat was almost blown away. If only it did get blown away. By this time, Callius had no choice but to stop eating. The unpleasantness during the meal suddenly became irrelevant. Tias. The old man hauled himself into the seat facing Callius, gasping at the plethora of food. Yeah, you need this kind of a meal to keep your stomach in shape. Did you get money from somewhere? Don't tell me you ripped off that de Bolivian woman again. However, immediately, Callius' sword slashed across the table like an agile tiger. Kang! Kig! Kikigijig! Sparks flashed like splendid fireworks. Hey, what a great sword! The old man was still sitting at the table, but his sword which received Callius's attack was revealed. A red blade, symbolizing a spirit sword. Contrasting it, the blue lightning flowing through the blade flashed intermittently. Is it just this sword? The owner of the thunderbolt sword, Rockin, and the only paladin in the north. Bernard. Bernard, the blue thunderbolt. Chapter 23 Blue Thunderbolt Sword, Rockin As its name suggests, Rockin's unique ability is called Blue Lightning. In other words, it is a sword that wields lightning. The Thunderbolt Sword, Rockin shows extremely excellent performance among the spirit swords with unique abilities from the elemental family. It doesn't let the wielder manipulate lightning directly, so it's not possible to do things like calling lightning from the sky or to shoot a targeted lightning bolt from the sword. But even so, the advantage of a sword overflowing with lightning is enormous. Most knights would just be electrocuted to death from one touch. Of course, the effect can vary wildly based on the presence or absence of divine power, but Rockin's unique ability is a huge advantage in battles where one instant can decide life or death. And if you push yourself a little, you can even launch AoE attacks a specification that can compete with any other sword of the same rank. On top of that, a sword with versatility. That's the Thunderbolt sword, Rockin. It's been a while, you scapegrace. It's been a while. Bernard. You've kept my sword well all these years. Seeing Rockin, I feel more at ease. Callius had been coveting Rockin since three years ago. Other swords could not be found or made with the skills he had at the time, but the Thunderbolt sword was different. An elemental family spirit sword famous for its power even among the same grade. The Thunderbolt sword that wielded lightning. If anyone heard you, they'd think you gave it to me for safekeeping. They sat with their swords facing each other. Bernard smirked as he was again hearing something absurd. It'll be mine soon. So. I'm not wrong. Ha, are you going to beg me for a sword duel again like three years ago? There's nothing wrong with that. Aren't you old enough to retire? How about you calmly hand over Rockin, and go spend the rest of your life comfortably sitting on the porch or whatever old people do? Things were not the same as before. Callius felt more confident now. All sorts of possibilities ran through his head. You're not listening to anything I say, as usual. Tut, tut, tut. Nothing seems to have changed. Rockin's lightning slowly seeped in. His right arm was going numb. However, in his elixir field, a bud of the six peak flowers technique was slowly unfolding. D. 
damage was being mitigated by the rising divine power. Callius' momentum, which had till now been masked by Vivi's bracelet, suddenly grew like a torrent. His pupils flashed silver, and the same color dyed the edge of his sword. There was a deep curve now at the corner of Bernard's lips. Looks like you didn't spend all that time in vain. Guess there are quite a few hidden cards. Stop your meaningless chatter and just give me the sword. It's better for Rockin to be in my young hands than in your old ones. Even the sky isn't as high as your arrogance. Chiang. Waiik. Callius' sword bounced off as Bernard twisted his body sharply. And his sword fell like a thunderbolt. I can't block this. Bang! Callius immediately kicked the table to push himself backwards. Quajic! Chwak! Bernard's sword split the table in two as it rushed in. Jijijic! The sword was dyed blue. Lightning flashed. Instantly, Bernard seemed to disappear. Callius' gaze turned upward. Bernard, holding his sword with both hands, emerged from the air as if he'd been hiding in it, and fell upon Callius like lightning. Quagwang. One of Bernard's specialties. Called, the lightning strike. Cook. The floor of the restaurant exploded as if a real lightning bolt had struck. Blue lightning streaks fulminated in all directions like a spider's web, chasing him down like a hunter chased its prey. Chwak! Callius blindly cast a silver sword strike to drive out the lightning. Swike! But Bernard's lightning broke through the deflagration to target him again. Kigajig! Kwong! Callius barely escaped with his neck by raising his sword and making Rockin minutely deviate its trajectory. Rockin's thunderbolt exploded on the wall behind him in a devastating manner. Just with that residual blue lightning. The blackened logs on the wall were cracked open and the snowstorm outside whistled into the room. What is that ominous sword? Against thunderbolt sword, Rockin, there were now two swords in Callius's hand. In his left hand was Lucen. In his right hand, he held the Predator sword, Lowe's which had blocked that final strike from Rockin. If it had been a little later, Rockin's red blade would have cut Callius' neck. Who? Wyak, Tass. Bernard did a somersault to dodge Callius' sword and landed on the table that had been split in half. The smell of blood on that sword is far too thick. It will drive its wielder to a frenzy. Then give me Rockin. How can I do that? I have a bond with this sword that has accompanied me for so many years. Shrung, cheek. Callius, who put Lucen back to its sheath, now tightly clasped the predator sword, lows with both hands. The bud of the six peak flowers technique has bloomed. The highly pure divine power that was unique to it spread through Callius' body. Quickly. Holding the predator sword in a grip so tight as if to break it, Callius' eyes started gleaming silver. Soon, the sword energy signifying the silver flower wave sword rippled on Lowe's blade. It has to end in one blow. If you drag it any longer, Bernard with Rockin will have the advantage. Callius no longer had any hidden cards, but he still believed in one thing. Six peak flowers bloom in late season, silver flower wave sword. Remember the duel with Esther. The sword that had been swung out of a moment's enlightenment. He had defeated a genius with that single sword. So, I will see that scene here again, once again. Kwong, he stomped on the floor hard as if trying to break it. Unlike his heavy footstep, his new sword quickly headed for Bernard. At the same time, Bernard's thunderbolt sword flashed. A fleeting moment's movement. Callius and Bernard clashed. Kwong. A roar resounded that was hard to believe as a clash between two swords. Kwajijik, Pajik. But it was only a fleeting moment, and Callius and Bernard had already passed each other in the opposite direction. Silver petals and blue lightning had clashed. It was unknown who won. But soon, a broken sword split the air. Wyak, P.U.K. 
a broken sword was stuck to the floor. A blue blade sword, with many missing teeth. Predator sword, Lowe's. It was Callia's sword. TTT. It was a defeat. There was a little blood dripping from his left shoulder. But the wound was shallow. There was only one shallow sword cut on the shoulder. Callius glanced behind him and restrained his divine power. Dururuk, cheek. Callius, who put Lowe's in its sheath, looked at Bernard with a dissatisfied expression. Bernard, in contrast, had a wild smile on his deeply wrinkled face. Ha 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 ha. What's funny? That Gervain's scapegrace has now grown so much, how can his master not laugh? Callius' face scrunched into a frown at the word master. Don't be an idiot. Since when have I been your disciple? Kaha, what a great day today is. Yes, yes, God will not begrudge me a drink on a day like this. Pawn. Bernard took out a bottle of wine from his sleeves and gulped it down. Hey! This is the Holy Spirit. A strong physique that didn't look like that of an old man. A loud voice. On top of that, the paladin had a quite arrogant personality. But still, Callius was amazed by how rude Bernard could be. It smells good. However, that striking wine fragrance brushing past him was enough to captivate Callius' senses. I'm not going to give it to you, so stop dreaming. If I gave it to you, even if I had a whole jar of wine, it won't be enough. I didn't even ask for it. He thought it was a pity in the depths of his heart, but Callius did not have any regrets. Bernard, so you were hiding in the corner all along. Who was that guy just now? As a teacher, I had to gauge how much my disciple has grown. If you'd just been wasting time, you were going to get a spanking. However, Bernard was satisfied. Surely, Callius got stronger. It's like he's a different person compared to back when he couldn't even hold a sword properly. Bernard struggled to hide his trembling hands and brought the bottle to his mouth. Ka! However, you failed to take my sword this time too. Scapegrace. My name isn't Scapegrace. I know, I know. What parent in the world would name their child something like that? But it's not the parents who give somebody that kind of name, but themselves. The old man was very good at twisting his words around. Callius asked, looking at him with a blunt gaze. What do you want to say? If fighting is the best teacher, wouldn't I be your teacher more than anybody else? It was quite difficult to avoid beating you to death, when you were trying to fight me for rockin' every day. You know that, right? TTT. -t -t. Of course. How could I not know? Three years ago. Approaching Bernard had been extremely intentional. He was the most affectionate and righteous among those who could become teachers for the players starting at Carpe. Not just his skill or talent, but his ability to teach others was also extremely excellent. In the first place, his status and traits were all specialized for teaching others. So, as soon as Callius became Callius, he looked for Bernard. If you learn from him, no matter how dull you are, your sword skills will inevitably sharpen. Due to Callius' crooked personality, I never treated him properly. For three years, it was quite troublesome because of the traits of mania and nobility that were engraved on the body. Bernard had been patient with him, but it wasn't the first time he'd been humiliated by Callius' temperament, which popped out from time to time. At first, I almost died. It had been quite eventful, but now in this world, the only person that Callius could trust would be Bernard. His only master. Outwardly he persisted in his stubborn denials, but in his heart, he regarded the old man as his master. The traits of a maniac and the pride of an aristocrat struggled against that feeling. Callius. Bernard's eyes changed. Callius breathed out a sigh at the sight. Whenever I have a fight with you, I always stake my life. His life, he says. This is your defeat again, so you have to grant me one request. Don't make me do weird things. 
I won't do anything bothersome like going to a strange ruin to get you alcohol. Callius wanted Bernard's sword. So Bernard had a duel with him a few times. But it was always a defeat for Callius. Whenever that happened, Bernard gave Callius an errand. No. That'd be too easy for you now. I won't do something that unfair. Then what is it you want this time? Have you met Emily? Do you know Emily? She's a kid with a lot of stories. Her divine blood seemed to have been blocked. But how could that happen to a child from Gervain? He'd been skeptical, but then ignored it. Because it wasn't important. Is it something to do with Gervain? Yeah. A hunting contest will be held in a few days. Fatalite's wheel. You should participate there. You mean? Yeah. Join there and protect Emily. Fatalite's wheel. In the past, to this place had come Fatalite, a saint and a paladin of the order. There was a word she'd spat out after a fierce battle in the northern white forest. A wheel. She'd said that the white forest was like a great wheel that turned without end. After saying those words, she disappeared, and in the Gervain family domain, when the beast's breeding season approaches, a hunting contest is held in the name of Fatalite's Wheel. The original purpose was to find the missing Fatalite, but now, hundreds of years later, it has become just an annual event to reduce the number of beasts. If you give me rockin', I'll think about it. Heh, you're still a long way off. You bastard. Bernard didn't even mention why Callius had to protect Emily or why he cared about the child. But since he had asked, Callius had no reason to refuse. Bernard, who came like a thunderbolt, drank all the alcohol and then calmly disappeared, leaving Callius silent. After a while. Gok! I, Master. Are you okay? This bronze is fine. Bronze, who suddenly came to his senses, ran to him and responded to questions that hadn't even been asked. Callius looked at him with tired eyes and opened his mouth. Bruns. Yeah, yeah. Master. Just say it. I'll deal with that pig bastard. Master won't even have to lift a hand. Said the guy who fell over in one hit. He was so weak that it couldn't be overlooked any longer. It looked like he needed some training. Wipe your nosebleed. It's ugly. Ah. Yes, yep. He. And get ready. Ah, uh, get ready for what? Fatalite's wheel. The doom of the north casts over you its deathly shroud. Survive. Reward. Chapter 24. Keeg. He passed the gates of the Javarsh and entered the chapel. It was late at night, but there was a man in the chapel, with his back to the moonlight entering from the door. The chapel's door was still open this late at night. Sook. He finally saw the man, who'd turned around, face to face. Despite wearing a noble attire and an easy smile on his face, that strong physique couldn't be covered up. Bernard's eyebrows twitched for a moment as if in annoyance, but only for a moment. The bosom of God is always open. But why is the next successor of Gervain here at this late hour? The man was the adopted son of Count Gervain, often mentioned as the next head of the household, who'd come back from the border. Calavan von Gervain. Apart from the current patriarch, he was the highest authority within the Gervain family. Bernard. I want you to join us on the wheel. He said that he wanted to participate together in the upcoming hunting competition, Fatalite's Wheel. The breeding season was approaching, and soon there would have to be war against the magic beasts flooding in. The hunt needed to happen before that occurred. Didn't I tell you last time? Calavan. The Lord asked me to protect Javarsh. Father is really being unkind to keep a paladin like you cooped up inside the castle. Even if an old man goes and wields his sword, how long can he keep it up? I'd be lucky to not get swept away by the wheel. Bernard waved his hand and laughed. 
However, Calavan made a sour face as if he wasn't going to give up easily. Bernard. As you know, I have to prove myself on this fatalite's wheel. And I have to show my son and daughter that they need to not be ashamed of their father. Sounds possible enough. No. It isn't. Calavan asserted. This time the fatalite's wheel will be very different from the previous ones. How can you be so sure? At Bernard's question, Calavan only gave a meaningful smile. Emily. I heard you spend a lot of time with her. She's a cute kid. Gervain is quite cruel to its own bloodline. Don't lions have a habit of dropping their cubs down a cliff? What do you want to say? Come with me. Otherwise, Emily might die on the wheel. Are you threatening me now? No, nothing like that. How can I threaten Master Bernard? I was just stating the truth. You don't know. Emily is a from the main branch of the family. It's true even for the collateral branch, but the main branch is even more cruel to its children. Emily von Gervain. The child, who descended from the direct blood lineage, was going to participate in the Fatalite's wheel. Lonely and alone, one, with nobody to rely on. She is a pitiful child. Without a mother or father, without a single person to support. Not only that, her divine blood is blocked, and yet, as Gervain's direct descendant, she has to bear the wheel. It's pitiful. Bernard swallowed. Everything Calavan said was true. Emily. The child was a direct descendant of Gervain, but had no parents. Therefore, she found the envy and jealousy surrounding her within the family difficult to bear, and was in a situation where she did not know when she could be bitten by the vortex of the family's internal power struggle. If only she had no talent. Contrary to the fact that her divine blood was blocked, her talent for swordsmanship was outstanding. The Gervain family, known as a family of master swordsmen, could not easily give up on Emily, even if her divine blood was blocked. That's how unique Emily's talent was. But if Bernard is with me, I will keep Emily in my arms and not let her be swept away by the wheel. Calavan, the patriarch's successor. He had the power and ability to do what he promised. Although he hesitated a little, after a while Bernard shook his head. This must also be God's will. Hmm. I'm sorry to hear that, but we still have plenty of time. If you change your mind in the meantime, please let me know. Kieg, Kwong. It wasn't until Calavan disappeared that Bernard clicked his tongue. He's like a snake. Rather than a guy like that. Bernard thought of another who happened to be particularly obsessed with his sword. A few days later. Fatalite's wheel. From your destiny flows the fate of death that covers you like a shadow. Survive. Reward? Hmm, is this the start? As I looked at the quest inside my room, my eyes stopped for a while on the reward. Fatalite's Wheel. Main quest. It started as expected. The preparations are in progress. So I just need to face this calmly. It was marked with question marks, but I roughly knew the rewards. If a quest appears on the pilgrim's path and the reward is a question mark, it implies one thing. Flexible. Compensation is flexible depending on the situation. There would be a quest completion level. From S grade to F. The reward varies according to the level. Thanks to that, I can't be sure exactly what is going to happen, but. The main storyline was conceived by me. There isn't much to take extra note of. If I can quickly turn Lowe's into a spirit sword. I can become stronger than I am now, and take over Rockin' from Bernard. And if I can strengthen Rockin' further, then go to Dexter to unlock its potential, there will be nothing to be afraid of. What is Fatalite's Wheel? A quest where a swarm of demonic beasts appear, hungering for nutrients during the breeding season. It's a simple quest where you have to go into the White Forest and hunt the demonic beasts in advance, but... Wouldn't it be great if everything in the world was as simple as that? 
this quest is the starting point. After the North collapses, all the high-ranking nobles of Carpe scamper to sell off their own country and scarper off to the Empire. The North's collapse becomes a signal for those bastards who've been quiet for so long, and they seize the opportunity to gang up with the Empire and devour the nation. The country was already in ruins, but the North's collapse signifies a disastrous loss of support for Carpe. The collapse of the Gervain family in the North, the symbol of Carpe, is the harbinger of its final downfall. And what begins that spiral is the failure of this quest. Talk, talk. As the sound of a knock disturbed my thoughts, I grabbed Lowe's which had been by the bed. Although the sword was broken in half from the middle, Lowe's can regenerate like a lizard's tail when fed with blood. In that respect, should I say it's useful or disgusting? Who is it? It's bronze, master. Come in. Kick, kick, kick. The door opened, but I did not let go of the sword. It had been quite a while since I learned the six peak flowers technique and developed sharper and more perceptive senses. The door opened and Bruns came in, somebody hiding behind him. It was impossible for me to not sense it. I, master. You pathetic bastard. Bruns was crying with his hands raised. There was a girl aiming a sword behind him. What could little Miss Gervain be doing in this kind of a shabby place? Emily Von Gervain. A young girl with black hair and gray eyes. A child holding an old-fashioned double-edged rapier, too, as if it fit her naturally. Emily looked at me with a straight gaze and opened her mouth. Grandpa told me. That you bastard will go to the hunt with me. I see. What does that have to do with threatening my servant? It's a test. Of course, this servant that looks like a smashed potato is disqualified. Who's a smashed potato? Heek! Bronze, who had been about to refute, raised his hand even higher at the sharp prod in the back. You're being threatened by a kid like that. How useless. I, master. Save me. I shook my head. So. Am I disqualified? I'm going to test that now. How are you going to test? Just as I was about to say that, Emily's rapier pierced the gap between us. Quick like the lightning. Arm outstretched. Lower body firmly stretched out to exert the maximum possible force. All of that combined to create a sharp sting that could not be expected from a child. Swayak. Teak. You're cheeky. I pinched the tip of Emily's rapier between my index and thumb. This level should have been enough for the bandits. If only the divine blood hadn't been blocked, that stab would have been something unsurpassable at that age. You have talent. She was a smart and clever child, but she also had an extreme talent in swordsmanship. She wasn't any worse than ordinary knights who didn't have divine power. So says the scapegrace. In that instant, Emily's form seemed to disappear. Better than bronze. As soon as her sword was caught, Emily released it and turned her body to land a roundhouse kick at my temple. It was an amazing demonstration of agility and jumping ability. Teak. However, no matter how much she had trained his body, she was still a child. Her strength did not surpass that gap. I lightly grabbed Emily's foot with my left hand and lifted it up and threw the blushing child away. Thud. You cheeky. It's not me who's cheeky, it's you. Did you try to test me with just that level of skill? Was that too much? Why are you so sad that I'm seeing those fat teardrops again? Am I the one in the wrong? Yeah, you kind of are. No, no. This is not my fault. This is your fault. Why is it my fault? You brought her with you. Then I'll go. I'll go bring you two some tea. So you're running away? Bruns ran away, and there was silence in the room. Also, children were annoying. A suffocating silence ensued. After a while. 
Emily, who secretly wiped the corners of her eyes, said as she sat on the bed pretending to be okay. Fine. It's all right for escape, Grace. I'll allow you to accompany me. It doesn't depend on you allowing it. I'm doing it at Bernard's request, not because you're cute or something. Hey, I don't want to be escorted by a nanny either. Then you go tell Bernard. That you don't need an escort. But for some reason, Emily didn't open her mouth any further. Why did Bernard ask Emily to participate in the Fatalites will anyway? Let's just say no now. No. There's no way that's going to work. Then, what is the reason? As I pondered slowly, the answer came unexpectedly easy. Are you being bullied by others in the family? Gervain's children are considered adults when they turn 12. It's not that they suddenly start being considered as an adult, but by hunting the demonic beasts of the north, they announce that they have become adults. Those who inherit the blood of Gervain must learn how to hunt monsters when they reach the age of 12. To prove themselves in that crucible. For Gervain, hunting beasts is an important matter that can be called a long-cherished dream. The same goes for Emily. However, Gervain is not crazy enough to push a 12-year-old child into the white forest alone. With so many magical beasts there, how could they dare do such a dangerous thing? The principle is to attach the knights of the family and organize a kind of party to act. Of course, it is natural that there is a difference in power even within the family, so if you don't have your own influence, the combat power you can gather is less. It depends on the number of vassals following you. The number of knights is bound to be small. And maybe for Emily. It is clear that she would have even fewer knights than that. Otherwise, Bernard, who clearly knew who I was, would have never made me do this. As if trying to stab me again, Emily's eyes started a little sharply at me. They're all just scared of me. I'm pretty, smart, and I'm good at swordsmanship. So that's the answer. You don't have parents? I must prove myself in this hunting contest, otherwise. I will be killed. Wait, what? Killed. What do you mean? The man who will be the next head. Calavan von Gervain, will kill me. Are you talking about that collateral branch who was adopted? Yeah. Why will the man who will become the next head kill you? It's not like you've inherited the bloodline of the main branch. As I said that, Emily shut her mouth tightly. Are you a direct descendant? Emily nodded her head. Callius' brows narrowed. As far as he knew, there were two direct descendants of the current patriarch. Callius, who had been expelled from the family. And Callius' sister, Elis von Gervain. Is she Elis' daughter? But that wasn't possible. Callius' younger sister, Elis, was already not in the Gervain's domain, and it was unlikely that she would have had a child. Then all that was left was Callius. I am twenty-six years old. Then I would have had to have an accident when I was only fourteen years old. That doesn't make a lick of sense. No way. Then there's only one possibility left. Are you the Count's child? Emily, who had turned her head as if she was sulking, nodded quietly. Chapter 25 Dakak Putting down the teacup, Bernard looked at the man in front of him, who exuded the aura of a sharp sword. Although he looked middle-aged, his dignified bearing was enough to match even the sovereign of a nation. The supreme ruler of the North. Albert and von Gervain. He was Count Gervain. Thank you for agreeing to my request. Nonsense. Shouldn't I even listen to this much if it's the master of the North who's asking? But. What is the reason for keeping me in Javarsh? The hunting competitions during Fatalite's Wheel, one, do bring a lot of benefits to Gervain. But it's not always beneficial. You seem to have something in mind. It's just an old man worrying. The Count didn't explain. But Bernard seemed to know what he was thinking. Are you suspicious of Calavan? Gervain's name holds that kind of weight. 
If they harm the family, even my own children must die. Anything that endangers the survival of the North, must face my sword. Whatever it is. That is the only way to safeguard the family, the North, and the country itself. Such is the Gervain Patriarch's way of life. Since the old days, from the founding of Carpe, Gervain has existed and will continue to exist in that manner. One of them was kicked out, and the other one left the family on her own two feet. However, I still have to protect Gervain, and I still have to protect the North. So I have to be careful. He was suspicious of Calavan. Exactly what he suspected was unknown, but Bernard could guess that it wasn't something favorable to Gervain or the North. Then Emily. When Emily's name came out, the lines on the Count's forehead deepened. That child has also inherited Gervain's bloodline. It is inevitable. Are you just going to leave things as they are? That child can't even properly use her power because of the problems with her divine blood. Even so. It's not just her bloodline, even Emily's hair and eyes are completely Gervain's. I can't be seen to favor one side over the other. At the Count's stubborn words, Bernard let out a deep sigh. Then Emily will die. She hasn't even seen the flowers bloom yet. There's no way he will leave Emily, the only direct descendant of Gervain's bloodline, alone. Even you, Count, can't pretend that you don't know. Death is surprisingly fair and natural. You may die at the age of ten, or you may die at the age of twenty. Death is a common and universal providence of nature. If you are weak, you die quickly, and if you are strong, you may live long. It might have sounded cold but both of them had been immersed in the harsh battlefields surrounded by savage swords for far too long. Therefore, Bernard could not refute the Count's words despite his deep sense of urgency. So, he took a different track. Callius is in the north. The Count's hand holding the teacup trembled. The tea surface rippled and swayed, and a drop of black tea dripped down the cup's side. He is no longer a Gervain but the blood does not lie. I entrusted him to escort Emily. I think you did something useless. I'd heard that he became a pilgrim. Even so, what would have changed if that scapegrace became a pilgrim? He'd be lucky to not get caught up in the problems of this wheel. A meeting between a genius who can't use her divine power, and a trash swordsman. Count Gervain couldn't help but laugh at the absurd combination. The Count shook his head and stood up from his seat, turning his back and approaching the window. It was a signal to leave. Bernard got up from his seat as well, adding a last word of encouragement. Your son has changed quite a bit. It won't be long before my sword is taken away. This will will change a lot in the north, looks like. Kick, thump. After Bernard had retreated, the Count murmured, looking intently at the small and childish old sword hanging next to his bookshelf. Why did you come? This winter. It's unusually cold, enough to make me shiver to my bones. After the interview with the Count, Bernard returned to the chapel to watch the red sunset. As many thoughts collided and interlocked in his head, it became heavy. When he woke up, staring listlessly at the ground, the night was already deep. However, his feet again wandered to the inn where the one in his thoughts was supposed to be. It's Bernard, right? Um, yes, do you know me? You're the one who destroyed my inn, so how can I not know? Ha ha ha. Ah, that's right. Come to think of it, I didn't even compensate you for it. This is really... No, no. Your disciple has already paid for everything. Did he? Bernard grinned at the mention of Callius. Did you come to see your disciple? That's right. So? Yeah, try going up. They went and bought some stuff from outside, then went up after eating dinner. Thank you. Bernard's feet climbed the stairs and reached in front of Callius' door. Talk, talk. As he knocked on the door, it opened as if waiting, and those blunt gray eyes looked down at him. What's going on? Looks like you've been waiting for me, 
but you're still making such a sullen expression. If you've gone senile with age, why don't you just quietly leave your sword behind? Age, ha! Huh? I'm still good enough for ten more years. Bernard entered the room with a pleasant smile and sat down on a chair. Okay, are you ready? We're preparing. Fatalite's wheel. The hunting competition would span seven days. So there was a lot to prepare. You'd also need to pack food and supplies for camping. And Emily. That cheeky little kid just came and tried to test me by swinging her sword. At Callius's expression saying how absurd that was, Bernard burst into laughter. Hey, she's a bit arrogant all right. Remind you of somebody? Don't talk bullshit. Actually, she still can't be compared to you, Gervain's idiot. Suddenly, I'm feeling sorry for Emily. I even said that she resembles the biggest trash in the world. Oh my. I'll have to go apologize to her right away, early tomorrow. Bernard giggled, as if teasing his student made him feel very excited. Of course, Callius faced him with a sarcastic expression. If you're only here to gossip, just stop. We're already quite busy. Why don't you think about the heart of the master who wants to spend even a little bit of time with his disciple who is going far away for so long? What kind of nonsense is the person who made me go that far away saying? That's hard to answer. That clogged up way of speaking is very much like the Count. Bernard secretly scolded Count Gervain, muttering that he and his son resembled each other in some unfortunate ways. The door isn't locked. Fine, you can't even take a joke. Bernard quickly erased his smile and opened his mouth again, pressing on his knees softly with his palms. I can't even take a single step out of the Javarsh. As long as the wheel spins. What do you mean? An uncaring attitude. It was the Count's request. Callius' eyebrows twitched. Protect the castle at the Count's request. As long as Fatalite's wheel is spinning, there is something fishy. He couldn't help but think that way. The Count doesn't seem to fully trust Calavan, whom he adopted. Besides, he asked me to protect the castle because there were some strange signs. It's got nothing to do with me. Why not? You are also the eldest son of Gervain's bloodline. Bernard, who snapped and shouted, looked into Callius's gray pupils. You still haven't forgiven your father. What happened back then? Bernard's mouth twitched in hesitation and stilled. It was probably a good thing. Eh <laughs> The Count must fulfill his mission in his own way. His destiny leaves him no other choice. It has nothing to do with me. Fine. Bernard shook his head at that stubborn attitude. Three years ago. Bernard and Callius were wandering the north. They spent most of their time in the white forest hunting the magic beasts, but they weren't the only ones there. It was because Bernard wanted Callius to accumulate a lot of experience. It was my fault. However, because of that greed, Callius met a person he did not need to meet and was seriously injured. He must have been angry that his son who had been kicked out was still wandering around the north. Still, the Count was a bit too harsh back then. Bernard sighed and clicked his tongue, thinking of Callius and the Count. At that time, what happened was due to his own greed, so Bernard had a sense of obligation. After that, Callius went on his pilgrimage alone, and Bernard entered the castle by himself. Even though he used to be the one who never left the White Forest. Then protect Emily too. Why do I have to protect the Count's hidden child? Isn't she your sister? I'm not from Gervain. Bernard let out a sigh. However, this time he stayed stubborn. Think of it this way. Have you ever seen your teacher tell you to do something wrong? It's all going to be helpful to you, so get along with that child. Who the hell is with that kid? She's going to be important to you too. So, don't be silly and just follow what I say. Druck. Callius glanced at Bernard standing up from his chair. Are you going? I've said everything I had to say. 
Bernard, grabbing the doorknob, looked back at Callius and frowned. Then he took a deep breath and shook his head. I'm going. No need to see me off. I wasn't going to. One day you'll be struck by lightning, too, dot. Come. Bernard snorted and left the inn. It was snowing heavily outside. Cough, cough. The corners of Bernard's mouth, after a few heavy coughs, became moist. Gathering some falling snow with both hands, he wiped his lips and started moving again quickly. At the places he had stood while coughing, the pure white snow was strangely dyed red. Poo! The sound of horns shook the north. The night errants and Gervain's troops, who had crossed the border, headed for the white forest one after another. Their numbers were well above the mark. A glorious and crowded procession. It wasn't for just any reason. For today was Fatalite's wheel. It was because it was the day the hunting competition started. So, they said that if you catch a beast and bring a token of proof, you will be counted. The schedule is a week in total. Bruns rushed over and explained the rules of the competition. The duration is seven days. During that time, camping in the white forest and hunting as many magic beasts as possible is what determines the winner of this competition. The honor and rewards from the Gervain family will go to the one who catches the greatest number of magic beasts. Honor is the ultimate pursuit of a knight. The reward is a method of practicing divine power handed down from the Gervain family. Both are useless. Of course, neither of these rewards were very desirable for Callius. He was a pilgrim who did not need the title of a knight, and it had been a long time since he'd learned the legendary Six Peak Flowers technique. You can get a sword too, if you want. It was Emily. She was wearing a double-edged rapier on her waist. The attire was not a fluttering dress as usual, but an outfit that was comfortable and warm. She was wearing light armor on the outside, so she still looked pretty cute. Anyway, it'll probably be a sword ordered from the church. Maybe something in the life sword grade. Callius pinched his nose. If that's the case, you don't even need it. If you already have two such swords, why would you need more? I'd rather get some artifacts. Damn things are hard to come by. I heard that this time we have some lavish stuff. Do you want to win? I can't even think about winning. People with Gervain's bloodline are automatically excluded, but nonetheless, everyone thinks that the family's successor, Calavan, is the one who will catch the most beasts. And that Calavan was aiming not just for the lives of the beasts, but also for Emily. Death while hunting a beast would be perfect. So don't die, you idiot. I don't like you enough to go erect something like a tombstone. Yeah, same here. And after a while. What's this? What's a half-wit? Three. Who can't even use her spirit power doing here? Right, right? Still, you do have a knight with you. Who are you? Don't you know that the knights following Emily will have to get out of sight, for, when our father becomes the lord? In front of them, not beasts but a pair of pale gray-eyed twins were chattering. Chapter 26 Poo! Fatalite's Wheel The sound of horns, heralding the start of the hunting competition, shook the north. Emily and I. And bronze, as well as Emily's two servants. The five of us headed to the white forest. The beginning was smooth. We borrowed a sled to load food and camping gear, which was pulled together by Bruns and Emily's attendants. I was on the sleigh. Master. It's too heavy. It's for your training. Isn't it just because you don't want to walk? His eyes were full of doubt, but I shook my head. I'm just widening my senses and looking for the beast's locations. Don't be so suspicious and just pull the sled. Yeah. There was still a lot of doubt in his shitty eyes, but Bruns couldn't say anything more. And I was, in point of fact, speaking the truth. Although, it was possible to find the signs even without sitting on the sled. Really? Really? 
It wasn't a lie. My aura sense, one, which had sharpened under the influence of six peak flowers bloom in late season, easily found the presences of the demonic beasts. And every time I found a magic beast's location, I directed the party to the opposite side. Really? But why aren't any magic beasts coming out? They ran away. The job Bernard asked me to do was to protect Emily, not to hunt the beasts. Unlike the kid sitting in front of me, I had a subtly different purpose, and I had to carry out my duties in a way that didn't bother me. In a few days, we'll find out what's going on. Right now, there was no need to spend our strength hunting the demonic beasts. So, what to do now? 1. Prepare for danger. 2. Practice. I sat on the sled and polished the bud of six peak flowers bloom in late season in my elixir field. The first bud had been slowly approaching the state of perfection. The divine power imbued in the first peak and its purity grew day by day. But now, both the size and purity had reached their limits. The time had come. A new path had to be carved out to make a second peak. Of course, it had to be made with a larger and more delicate bud than the first peak, and the amount of divine power and purity needed to double. It took several years to achieve the first peak, but that didn't seem to be the case for the second. It didn't seem like it would take long to achieve a second peak because of the momentum. Is it still difficult to achieve in a short time? I'd already made one bud in my elixir field but if I tried to make another next to it, it somehow scattered every time. Felt like it could not coalesce properly after the power was gathered. Strangely, the same process for the first peak didn't work for the second. As if the first peak's very existence interferes with making another one. Am I in too much of a hurry? That might be the reason. My spirit quality is only at level 4. This may simply not meet the quality required to achieve a second peak. As I thought about it, my eyes naturally turned to the bracelet. Vivi's bracelet. Great epic. Bracelet given to you by an elf living in the shaking forest. Minimizes divine power usage and saves the reduced divine power. Stored divine power, 37556. It had been a little over a month since I last loosened the bracelet but that was about it. Originally the stored power was more than this. However, as time passes, the divine power contained in the bracelet fluctuates wildly, increasing and decreasing in turn. Because of the issue of purity. Vivi's bracelet circulates its collected spiritual energy by itself, and in the process, a lot of impure spiritual energy is expelled. So, even after a lot of time has passed, the gathered divine power is only at this level, but the quality has improved instead. If I take this off, I might be able to open a second peak. But that's just a guess. It's a bit embarrassing to test. Fatalite's wheel. I don't know what's going to happen this time. And, of course, in addition to the bracelet, there's also the sacred stone. Whenever I have some spare time, I take out the sacred stone and feel the saint's divine power imbued within, so if I just give it a little time, I should be able to make some progress in the six peak flowers technique. Fatalite's Wheel The shadow of death emanating from fate covers you like a shroud. Survive Fatalite Referring to an inescapable inevitability decreed by fate. In the Northern White Forest, the word fatality is more appropriate than fate, or destiny. In addition, there are a total of two tribes here for whom the word fatality is appropriate. One is Gervain. Another one is across the White Forest. At the edge of the North. What's this? What's a half-wit who can't even use her spirit power doing here? Right, right? Still, you do have a knight with you. Who are you? Don't you know that the knights following Emily will have to get out of sight when our father becomes the lord? In front of us, not beasts, but a pair of pale gray-eyed twins were chattering. Riven, Rene. Emily's eyes, who had been looking anxious about why she couldn't find the beasts, turned cold. Riven and Rene. 
They were fraternal twins with dark hair and gray eyes, similar faces but different sexes. These are the children of Calavan, who people think will be the next patriarch. Right. One of Emily's attendants came up to me and whispered. I'm not really curious, so why are you telling me? Taking a peek, the servants' expressions weren't that good either. Why? Ha ha. Rene. Look at Emily's attendance. You don't have any tokens with you, so you haven't even managed to catch a single beast so far? Is that true? Really, Emily? You haven't caught a single one in this white forest teeming with magic beasts? Or maybe you didn't have time to catch one because you were busy running away? Ha ha ha. Actually, it'd be strange if Emily the halfwit did catch one. Those impolite kids just kept chattering. The twins Riven and Rene are feuding with Miss Emily. Without me even asking, Emily's maid with brown hair whispered beside me. Judging from the tone of voice and her facial expression, it seemed that the attendants didn't like them either. Of course, I had nothing to do with it, so I just watched. Orphan is there too. Orphan, one of the night captains, seemed to be escorting the twins. She glanced at me and bowed slightly. Last time you tried to kill me, did you change your mind a bit? Or is this the bare minimum courtesy? But this is still pretty good. Would you like to see the game we caught? Who spoke was that girl with the ponytail, Rene von Gervain. Next to her was the naughty-looking boy, Riven von Gervain. They looked to be about fourteen years old. No, I don't need to. Because, you see? Don't you have to know what the beasts look like before you can catch them? Rini and Riven took Emily's hands and showed her what she didn't want to see. The proof of catching a beast is its nose and ears. Or you can simply cut their head off, so Riven and Rini had cut the beast's head and put it on a dedicated cart. Voila! How is it? Isn't it great? We had a hard time catching it, you know? It was so fast that I almost got eaten in one bite. The head of the beast on the cart was quite huge. It was a wolf beast with strong jawbones and sharp fangs, big enough to swallow Emily in one gulp. You'll never catch something like this, right? It'd be great if you don't pee your trousers because you'll freeze the moment you meet one, right, Rene? You're right. Even I froze for a moment and couldn't move. Emily, if it were you, you would have definitely peed. Seeing Emily's rotten expression, the twins looked thrilled. But Emily's reaction was no fun at all, so the twins' eyes soon turned to me. But who are you? A knight errant? Riven and Rene asked, but I did not care to answer. There were many reasons for not answering, but the reason that accounted for the largest percentage was because of annoyance. Whatever the status of these little Gervain kids, whatever the circumstances, I basically didn't like little children. Besides, these cheeky little noble types, especially. Oikophobia? Hating my own kind? That might be it. Ironically, the trait of a fool is to recognize others who are the same type of fool. Emily, your follower is so cocky. He doesn't even answer our questions. That's right. How cheeky. Perhaps the child's patience was not as long as I thought, because Riven drew the sword from his waist first. A long sword suitable for children. Did you catch a beast with a sword like that? Without a drop of blood on your clothes? The twins' faces contorted as I laughed out loud. Are you kidding me? Is that bastard laughing at my sword now? My brother's honor has been tarnished. You're in big trouble now. Even a child has honor now? What kind of honor do they have, exactly? There was nothing for it but laughter. Come down from there. Are you looking down on us when you're a mere knight errant? That's right. You came to the north to get a job? But you ended up escorting Emily. It's so stupid. There's no way you'll get any benefits escorting a child who has nothing. Are you stupid? Emily was quiet. She was looking at Callius, J. 
just to see what he would do. Bronze, who should have already stepped forward and made a loud ruckus by now, was also quiet. Callius was hiding his identity and was in charge of the escort, so Bronze was forcefully putting up with his itchy mouth. Reluctantly, Callius got off the cart and stood in front of Riven. You cheeky bastard. You have to pay for the crime of ruining my honor. He was a pretty aggressive kid. Perhaps it was his trust in Orphan and the knights behind them that made him act so frivolous. Besides, he must have been used to recklessly swinging his sword with his identity and Gervain's name behind his back. Callius clicked his tongue, pulled something out of his pocket and held it out. A fork? It was his favorite fork. Fuck! Hey! Are you insulting me? Emily turned her head as if she couldn't contain a burst of laughter, and Riven screamed in outrage, thinking he was being insulted. I don't have anything smaller. You dare to insult Gervain's Riven, and you think you will survive? Brother! Show us what you got! You have to win! Okay. If you're mocking me with something like that, you should be prepared to lose an arm. Riven's sword swung. Hmm. He raised his physical ability with the divine power he had cherished since childhood, and maximized its efficiency with Gervain's divine power training method. Thanks to that, Riven's sword showed something different from the movements of a child. A swordsman's poise, perhaps. Strength. Speed. And the divine power, too, all were beyond that of a child. The heavy sword, too, style unique to Gervain, nimble yet weighty. While stepping lightly, Riven was wielding a sword that felt so heavy. That arm, I'll take it. Callius' arm. There was only a fork in his hand. Riven had no doubt that his sword would cut off the man's arm. The moment the sword came into contact with the fork. Wyik. Gijik. Ah. Uh, Chiang. When he came to his senses, Riven found himself lying down on the snow. Startled, he jumped up. Waiik, P-U-K. His broken sword flew through the air, crashing to the ground. What? The man stood still, holding that fork in front of him. Callius spoke, looking down at Riven with a calm gaze. Yeah, you're still a kid. Chapter 27 the Gervain Twins. The children of Calavan, who will become the core powerhouses of the next generation. Orphan, assigned to escort Riven and Rene, had recently been struggling with the thoughts of someone branded into her memory, even while she was busy hunting the beasts. That someone was Callius von Gervain. He appeared suddenly, and disappeared suddenly as well. More precisely, that swordsmanship, from one who had abandoned the name of Gervain and become a pilgrim. That swordsmanship never left her thoughts, and was a constant source of torment. Silver Flower Wave Sword That sword she had seen at that time, even if only for a moment, was still clear in her mind's eye. Silver Flower Wave Sword It was similar to the Silver Flower Wave Sword wielded by Saint Stella in the legends. There was no room for doubt. Because there was only one swordsmanship in the world that broke the opponent's swordsmanship and transformed the energy into silver petals. How could a scapegrace wield that sword? Besides, that sword. No matter how great a sword art may be, if the skill of the one performing it is poor, it ends up mediocre. But that wasn't the case for Callius. He had the strength worthy of that swordsmanship. And right now, Orphan saw Callius holding the fork, and was convinced. He must have hidden himself on purpose. No matter how immature Riven's swordsmanship is, it cannot be written off as just a sword with some divine power behind it. He is a descendant of the bloodline of Gervain. Manipulation of divine power, and Gervain's unique sword art. All of that was incorporated into his swordsmanship. To beat that with a fork? Utter nonsense. Yet Callius managed it. And on top of that, to break a sword with a fork.
Callius easily blocked Riven's sword with his fork, slid the sword between them from that point of contact, and then broke it with a snap of his wrist. It showed his strong power and immaculate skill. And it is was something that definitely could not be achieved without very precise and skilled manipulation of spiritual power. Why? She didn't know why, even with that level of skill, the emanations of his divine power felt so weak. From Orphan's point of view, Callius should have been one of the strongest swordsmen in the North. At least that's how she saw it. My, my sword. No, how could a fork or whatever break the sword I got from my father? This, this. Riven looked like he was in a panic. Although from the collateral branch, he was born in a famous swordsmanship family, and yet his sword, which he was proud of, was broken by a mere fork, so how could he not? It would be a tall order for even an adult to endure the current situation, but Riven was only a fourteen-year-old kid. It's a special sword that my father gave me, but that, a fork. He couldn't stabilize his emotions at all. He looked alternately at the fork Callius was holding and his broken sword, and then bit his lip. Damn it. What are you all gawking at, just standing around? Riven's voice, full of anger, woke up the knights who had been watching the scene with admiration. Shrung. Five knights drew their swords. Orphan had been contemplating what to do, but now she had no choice but to draw her sword as well. Can I do it? Would a mere half-dozen knights be an opponent for one who has mastered Stella's sword? Orphan bit her lip. Now get him down on his knees and bring him to me. To insult me is the same as insulting Gervain. Hmm. Callias started at the knights approaching him with a blank face. This little boar, one is so annoying, but what can you do? This was business as usual for aristocrats. Callius glanced at the approaching knights and put Emily behind him. The girl was holding her stomach, sniffling as if she'd seen a funny show. Now you'll have to see blood at the climax. Stop. A low, heavy voice made the knights stop in their tracks. Soon, the snow-covered bushes swayed and sprinkled snow and a good-looking man appeared from between them. As soon as they saw his face, the knights bowed their heads in surprise. He was Gervain's successor. Adopted son of Count Gervain. And, Riven and Rene's father. It was Calavan von Gervain. Ah, father. Father. As soon as Riven and Rene saw Calavan, they ran to him with wide smiles. However, they had no choice but to stop, because the sword Calavan was holding was soaked in the blood of demonic beasts. Father! He insulted me. That's right. He insulted brother. He broke brother's sword with a fork. How could you do that? That's amazing. Brother's sword is so sharp, and it broke like kindling. If he doesn't kneel, Gervain's honor will be besmirched. Riven scrambled to say something like that, repeating like a parrot the phrase that who knew whether was a curse or a compliment. Calavan wiped the blood off his sword and asked Orphan. What's going on? That is. After a while. Hearing about the course of events, Calavan looked at Callius with curious eyes. And then proposed. Will you swear allegiance to me? Ah, father, that's, what? I'm a person who puts talent above anything else. I don't know what you're looking for or why you got involved with the wheel, but whatever you wish for, I can make it happen. I have that power. Everyone was surprised by Calavan's sudden suggestion. Emily was the same. C.A. Dash, Master Calavan. Emily moved to stand in front of Callius in surprise, and opened her arms as if trying to ward Calavan off. An attitude like screaming, never. Emily. Calavan looked at Emily and narrowed his eyes. He is my escort. Emily. I'm sorry to tell you, but the choice is not ours. If you have any pride as a swordsman, you should respect his choice. Ignoring Emily, who was hesitating and speechless, Calavan turned to Callius who was still wearing his hood. 
even if my son's sword was held by a child, it wasn't something to be broken by a fork. So, if it was a fork that broke the sword? No, there was no need to see more of Callius' skills. It's sudden. There is nothing sudden. If you want fame, you will have to swear allegiance to me, who will become the next head of the family. If you want success, you will have to follow me even more. Isn't that right? There was nothing wrong in what he said. The adopted son of the present Gervain Patriarch. The Count's successor. On top of that, his swordsmanship skills were excellent and his leadership skills were exceptional. He was a caring father to his children, and had a broad enough heart to hold the loyalty of his knights. If it had been an ordinary knight errand, no matter how much Emily tried, it would not have been easy to refuse his offer. I refuse. But that wasn't the case for Callius. As if he didn't expect to be refused so curtly, Calavan's expression distorted monetarily, but then it again returned to a soft smile. Can you tell me why? I seek neither fame nor success. Because they are not necessary. Looking at Callius retreating back, Calavan asked again. Then what do you want? Sword. A stronger sword. Saying so, he led Emily and her attendants away. Looking at his back disappearing into the woods, Calavan licked his dry lips. Ah, father. He insulted me. Riven. I don't know what kind of honor you've lost, but this time, you'll have to endure it. Why? That man is not a knight. Then what is he? A stronger sword. It has only one meaning. Calavan said, stroking the hair of his son who had questioned with innocent eyes. Perhaps, a pilgrim. Tadak, Tadak. Even the bustling white forest had become quiet by the time moonlight fell. Around a small bonfire, Callius and his companions sat and rested after a brief refreshment. Why did you do that? Sighing, Callius looked at Emily, whose eyes were fixed on the bonfire. What do you mean? The fork. You didn't have to do that to Riven. She was asking about what happened before. Callius thought for a moment, then threw a piece of wood into the bonfire. The level of that kid was about perfect for a fork. That's all? That's it. A lie. Riven and Rene. The two's tendencies were well known to Callius. The two were notorious as Gervain's little terrors when they were young, but given a few opportunities, they will come to their senses and become great knights. There was one such route. I know because I created several possible routes. Besides, Riven and Rene were meaner than I'd thought, and I didn't like how they were behaving. So I deliberately touched Riven's pride, and ended up breaking his sword. With a fork. I'd honestly been uncertain if it would be possible. However, the fork, under the influence of the Silver Flower Wave Sword art, brilliantly broke Riven's sword, and also broke his arrogant pride. I don't know if he'll wake up with just this or not. Although there will be more opportunities in the future. Otherwise, it'll be difficult. Now that the Fatalite's Will quest has appeared, even if it's only a child sword, the North will need it. Thank you. Thanks to you, I felt refreshed. Emily, who imitated Callius and threw another piece of kindling into the fire, got up and went into her sleeping bag. Callius looked at Emily with strange eyes, and then pulled out Lowe's. Have you regrown a little? Lowe's, which had been broken in half, had regrown a little after Callius entered the white forest and hunted a few beasts there. Not as fast as a lizard's tail, but the rate of regeneration was still quite strange. Predator Sword, Lowe's. Grade, Life Sword. Inhabited Soul, a Mixed Soul. Unique Ability, Predation. Predation Count, 723. When the bandits were wiped out, it was close to 500. The number of magic beasts he'd occasionally hunted in the north while scouring the white forest for Bernard exceeded 200. If you catch roughly just 300 more, the rank of Lowe's will go up, so it's a smooth journey so far. 
when Fatalite's will turns in earnest, this 300 or so number will be nothing to talk about. It is only a matter of time before Lowe's rises to the rank of Spirit Sword. That way, even if you fight with Rockin', it won't break or degrade easily, so it'll be worth trying. By the way, Callius' eyes gleamed sharply as he looked around. Tack, Taddock. All he could hear was the sound of the bonfire. The forest was exceptionally quiet. Strangely, nothing was captured in his aura sense. Most of the magic beasts in the white forest were nocturnal, but they were being so quiet, wasn't it suspicious? Feels like something beyond my perception, slithering around. Clouds were slowly covering the moon overhead. As the round full moon was obscured, the whole area was dyed in darkness, insulting the given name of the white forest. Then, a foul odor hit the tip of his nose. At the same time, the forest shook. Ripples of energy were spreading out. When the clouds lifted again, and the pale moonlight once again illuminated the surroundings, a huge axe, dripping blood, was before his eyes. The large arms holding it, and the green skin engraved with primitive tattoos. One of the sons of the axe god, riding on the back of a giant beast was looking down at him. The chain of fate coils around you. Survive the fate of death. They have many names. A tribe created by the demons, who are sometimes called barbarians, greenskins, magicborn, too, or even witch beasts. Demi-humans who live beyond the white forest's northern edge. Primitive and savage, a tribe of warriors unafraid of death. With an axe in hand, those warriors cry out the name of their god and seek a worthy death on the battlefield. But a more accurate name for them is Orc A barbarian race from the north, whose battles with Gervain have stretched across the white forest for centuries. It was an orc. Chapter 28 The forest became noisy very quickly. Mountain birds that had been sleeping under the dark cover of night began crying, and accompanying it, echoed a mixture of men's shouts and the shrieking of beasts. At the center of it all, a red glare. Muscles with bulging veins at the surface. A giant greenskin form, over two meters tall. The orc warrior looked down at Callius from atop his mount and spoke in an unknown language. His breath left a long stream of pure white in the air. A voice like a piece of wood being scraped with a sword. Those low, harsh syllables sounded one after another. Master, what is that guy saying? Let's fight. It was a language he didn't understand at all. Even so, Callius' ears could hear the intent buried within the words. Perhaps because of Bard's blessing, he was able to intuit their general meaning from the pitch of the voice and the pattern of breathing. They went something like this. The wheel turns. Dot. Fight me, if you are also a warrior. Dot. This land shall be our battlefield. Dot. Despite the plain delivery, the meaning was conveyed clearly and with certainty. Kwong! The orc jumped off the beast's back and made a hacking motion with the axe he was holding in his hands. Why yik? P-U-K. Ah! His hands blurred as he threw the axe. Almost instantaneously, it struck one of Emily's attendants. The force behind the throw was so strong that a popping sound hit the onlooker's eardrums. Fast! It was no lie that an orc warrior's strength could equal five human conscripts, and their axes were powerful enough to kill three men at once. Ooh! The orc warrior jumped. With a powerful thrust from his legs, that giant form jumped high into the sky and grabbed the axe again with both hands. Two blades jutted out from the axe's spine, and he raised it high. That huge double-edged axe. He slammed it down atop Callius' head as if aiming to split him in two. Qua on. Kook. Callius, who immediately used his sword to parry and turned to evade that great axe, saw the nearby bonfire suddenly burst into a flash of bright red. That dazzling brightness, which illuminated the burning eyes of the orc warrior for a moment, quickly faded as the fire was savagely trampled on. Oh, this bastard! 
Why are there orcs here? They. This isn't the time to ask questions. Bruns. Yes. Yeah. Master. Take Emily and run. I, Master. What he wants is a battle. A life-threatening battle. A strong enough enemy, that was what Callius represented to the orc warrior. I can't leave you here alone. Emily. You must come with us now. Damn it, Callius. Let go of me. Emily shook off the servant's grasp and hurried over. With a solemn expression, she pulled out her sword and stood next to Callius. You'll only be a hindrance. The orcs are raiding all over the White Forest, anyway. I know what this is. I am not a child. I am a Jervain. So that's your final decision? I'm going to face the beast. We'll all die anyway if you lose. Well, that's not wrong. The wheel has already turned. Orcs will spread throughout the White Forest and fight the knights. Even if Bruns and the attendants still alive somehow manage to run away with Emily, they will not be able to overcome the mobility advantage of the orcs riding demonic beasts, so escape was hopeless that way. This land shall be our battlefield. Dot. You talk too much. What? The orc was acknowledging Emily's spirit, that she was a warrior despite being so young, but that pride carried with it a high price. In the end, it meant she would be killed. Callius drew his sword. A sword with holes in its blade. Predator sword, Lowe's. Is that demon magic? Come find out. The opponent became furious at the sight of Lowe's. Possibly because it was a demon sword. Emily. Yeah. Don't act first. If you can, watch quietly like a mouse. Unlike me. You have talent. Toss. Qua on. Emily staggered at the booming shockwave of a sword and an axe colliding. However, that was not the end. A series of sweeping sword attacks followed. Callia's sword appeared like dozens instead of one, and the orc's axe that opposed it was the same. As they struck each other, shockwaves kept erupting and the continuous noise rattled her body. However, Emily, even when she stumbled, did not once take her eyes off the duel. The young Gervain opened her eyes wide as if engraving every single detail into her mind. Those young gray eyes did not once lose sight of the violent battle, nor of the petals dancing in the air. Quajic! Orphan, after crushing a beast's head by trampling on it, wiped the blood off her sword. Looking to the side, she saw Calavan observing his bracelet and occasionally touching it with his index finger. Each time, the bracelet sparkled. As if it was a signal. Orphan's eyes narrowed for a moment. Master Calavan. Um, Orphan. How's the situation? We have to evade, and quickly. I told you the beasts were behaving strangely, but it's actually an attack by the orcs. Attack by the orcs. This was an unusual omen. Historically, they weren't usually the type to use such a large-scale tactic for launching a surprise attack. Above all, why make a preemptive attack in such haste? It couldn't be ignored. They had to return to the castle immediately to report the truth, then start a counterattack across the whole front. Only such immediate action could restore the spirit and status of the North. Well, true enough. But for some reason, Calavan's expression was still calm. As the successor of Gervain's bloodline, he should have been furious at the orcs. Many of the knights hunting the beasts in the White Forest died due to the attack, and those who remained were still fighting. Even as this conversation continued, the blood of the North was dying the snow red. Why are you? Even then, why are you so calm? Not only calm, Orphan thought he even looked relaxed. I think you should give the order to evacuate and return to the castle. Why? The situation is strange. The appearance of orcs at this time is quite suspicious. Orcs had never appeared during the hunting contest when the forest was noisy. Even if they did, 
it was just one or two, those with a strong lust for battle and victory. It could be safely said that this was the first strategic surprise attack on their part. Hmm. Calavan kept looking at the bracelet for a long time. To be precise, at a strange jewel embedded in the middle of the bracelet. Artifact, to contact the Count? However, Orphan's thoughts came to a halt as Calavan spoke. First of all, we're leaving the forest. So we're retreating to the castle. No, not to the castle. We'll be taking shelter somewhere else for a while. The current situation is abnormal, and it's not clear what their purpose is. It's unknown if this surprise attack is a one-off, or if they've planned for a long battle. It won't too late to move once we gather more information. Then, Jervain remains in Javarsh. You don't have to worry about it, orphan. However, P.U.K. Calavan kicked Orphan in the shin. Ouch. It's a wartime situation right now. I, the next head of Jervain, have the ultimate authority in the field. Disobedience of orders will be immediately punished. Orphan didn't speak anymore. She just pretended not to hear the sound of the bracelet Calavan was wearing, vibrating at regular intervals. Kigajigig. Kwaan. How fun! You're like a wild boar. The attack pattern was infinitely monotonous. However, each mighty blow shook the earth, and rattled callous bones. In addition to the natural physical qualities, that reckless disregard to not avoid attacks at all, made the opponent difficult to deal with for Callius. Silver Flower Wave Sword The sword art used the styles of the Quick Sword and the Phantom Sword. A fast sword focused on speed, and a sword that deceived its opponents with dazzling technique. In the first place, the Silver Flower Wave Sword itself was naturally a swordsmanship that was created to deal with stronger opponents. However, Callius realized the moment he faced the orc. Not very compatible. It didn't work well against these guys. The reason lay in their temperament. Orcs are berserkers by their very nature, and they are never afraid of being struck by the enemy's sword. Unafraid of death, their instincts focus only on killing their opponents with one swing of an axe. A fighting method that cares not a jot for your own life. This is why they are called savage barbarians. So, Callius was a little troubled. The axe was comparable in grade to the predator sword, Lowe's, and the skill of the wielder was enough to stand proud among the orc warriors. The technique looked flawless even in just this brief battle, and to strike those dense muscles felt like kicking a stone. Orc. In other novels and games, they were treated as trash mobs but this was not at all the case in the Pilgrim's Path. Warriors with physical abilities and pride superior to humans. A heteromorph race that wanders the battlefield like deathless immortals in service to the Axe God, Kuanta. Such were the orcs. Ugh. Chiang. Chiig. Callius, as he was being pushed back, shrugged and retreated. I can't let the fight draw out. Even if they were in the middle of a fight right now, other orcs might arrive any time. Time was not on his side. He had to win the duel in a flash. The six peak flowers technique was blooming in his elixir field. As the first peak unfolded like a rising sun, the pure divine power spread throughout his body. With each step, his momentum accelerated. Tot. Tot. Pawn. Die. The orc warrior's axe hacked down overhead, accompanied by a joyous roar. Naturally, Callius also drew lows and unleashed a single sword strike. Qua on. The orc warrior's axe struck lows down. Even so, a flash of embarrassment spread on the face that had been smiling full of joy. Lowe's was only the bait. In Callius' left hand, life sword, Lucin was held in reverse. Chwak. Leaving Lowe's to drop to the ground, Callius swung Lucin and cut off one of his opponent's legs. Then the sword straightened and arrived at the orc's neck. Great dot. There was no fear in the eyes of the orc who said so. All there was, 
was regret. You too. Sook. Callius stretched out his hand against the fallen orc's carcass. However, only for a while. His gaze stopped in the air. Fatalite's wheel. Avoid the fate of death that flows from your destiny. Survive. Stop the attack of the orcs. Number of orcs killed, one. Reward, F, dash. It doesn't change if you catch just one. It was pretty hard, though. Callius looked at the orc warrior's corpse, reached out his hand again, but then retracted it. I need to save my energy. No matter how powerful the bracelet is, you never know what will happen. There's nothing wrong with being careful. And the swords I have are enough. Damn. Don't be so uppity. Callius, who had been sheathing Lusen and Lowe's, stopped. I don't have the time to rest. The beast tamed by the orc warrior was roaring, baring its teeth. Callius, raising Lowe's again, moved towards Emily, who had been confronting the beast. Kung. After defeating the beast without too much difficulty, the quest window changed. Number of orcs killed, one. Number of beasts killed, one. The count of the beasts caught was also being measured. From now on, every single action he would take inside the forest would be taken into account for determining the final grade of the quest. Damn. What is that swordsmanship? You don't need to know. Ignoring her cheeks bulged in a pout, Callius slowly expanded his aura sense by operating a peak flower. It's dangerous, but... You need to fight, as much as possible. If you don't, some useless reward will come out. This quest will only ever come once. There are many ways to increase the reward level, but the easiest and most efficient way... You can't just miss this opportunity. Having made up his mind, Callius walked straight into the woods. Ma Dash, Master. Where are you going? Where are you going? Are you crazy? Why are you going? If you want to die, go die alone. It sounded as if he was walking towards his own death, but he did not stop. He walked towards the source of the screams as if natural. They treat you like the worst trash of all nobles, and you're going to save them. Callius stopped at that and said to Emily, who was looking angry for some reason. I'm not a noble. He could do anything for his sword. I'm just a pilgrim. Chapter 29 Shit, damn it. Kong. Kwong. You bastard. Calm down. I don't want to fight you, fuck. Don't run away. What are you even saying, you bastard? Aaron, a giant knight wielding a greatsword, felt like he was about to die. First, he was caught by a crazy old man, then he almost died fighting with some random guy, and he even lost his armor, then once he entered the forest and was wrestling with a beast, suddenly the orcs attacked. Die! Die! Die damn it! Kwong! 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 The sword and the axe collided non-stop. However, the situation was completely different compared to how it seemed from the outside. Unlike the orc, who was carefully blocking Aaron's attacks, he was very nervous because any of the other orcs or beasts present could attack anytime and from anywhere. Perhaps because of that. Teen. Aioa. He lost his sword, and the bastard's blue-edged axe ripped through his chest. Although the wound was shallow, Aaron foresaw his own death. Losing your sword in a life-and-death duel means your end is already determined. That green monster won't wait for him to grab his sword. Damn it. Aaron, closing his eyes tightly, fell to the ground in an unsightly heap. However, for some reason, that axe did not pierce into his body. He wondered what was going on. Galolia look. He could hear the sound of blood pouring out. When he opened his eyes in surprise, he saw a hideous sword bristling serrated teeth, pierced through the heart of the orc. Tias. Behind the fallen orc, jet black hair and gray eyes were reflected in Aaron's eyes. Um. You. 
You! Bastard, you ruined my armor. Gervain. The same Gervain he'd seen at the inn. Bastard? Ah, I meant my lifesaver. Thank you. Thank you. You're like an angel. As Aaron lowered his head, Callius' cold eyes turned to another direction. As he hurried on, he kept stabbing orcs from behind who had been facing the other knights. No, he was just looking for the knights. Aaron tilted his head, but he couldn't afford to ponder on it. Because living was more important right now. Bronze. This guy here is hurt. Yep. Bronze is coming. Um. You, have I seen you somewhere? Aaron bowed his head quickly. I don't know, ugh, it hurts so much. Oh, I'll stop the bleeding. Fortunately, Bruns didn't seem to remember the face of the one who'd punched him into unconsciousness. Feeling lucky at that fact, Aaron asked about the Gervain who was relentlessly attacking the orcs. Who is he? He is a noble among nobles, a man among men, and not satisfied with just that, he became a pilgrim. Although an iron-blooded swordsman, he still has warmth in his heart. No, I mean his name. If you ask that, he's Callius von Gervain. Callius von Gervain. I'm Emily von Gervain. You, your wounds are so shallow, so get up and grab your sword again. And fight alongside that bastard. He saved your life, so even if you die, don't let him die. If it weren't for Callius, you'd be dead. You had no chance to live. That's true, but... Even that bastard is saving others and killing the orcs without caring about his own life. You're bigger than him. You're bigger. Aaron eventually bit the bullet, one, hauling up his aching body and chasing after that fluttering red cloak. A smile spread across Emily's lips as she looked at his back. The number of knights following Callius was increasing. When he first ran towards the orcs, she thought he was really crazy, but he was saving lives by easily killing the orcs fighting the knights. It must have been be difficult for him too. He was looking for knights to save, even though he never knew when and where the orcs might appear to kill him. Thank God. She didn't know what she was praying for, but that's how he felt. Nia. Yes, lady. Do you think Callius will be all right? There were knights by his side. None of them were uninjured, but nonetheless, they followed Callius with their wounded bodies. Most of them were idiots, but the fact that they survived the orc's axes, even if only for a little while, was proof of their worth. He'll be fine. Despite all his rumors demeaning him, he's still a Gervain. Anne. The attendant named Neo looked at Emily with a bitter look. He's ladies. Enough. A scapegrace is just a scapegrace. I'm just worried about him not getting hurt, so we can survive. That's all. Nia looked at Emily, who was trying to turn her face away, with sad eyes. There really was no point in saving him. It was the guy who'd interrupted my meal at the inn. A rash knight who believed only in his size and power. If I had known it was this bastard, I wouldn't have bothered saving him. Callius clicked his tongue. Number of orcs killed, 12. Number of beasts killed, 27. Number of people saved, 15. Reward, C. Dash. However, the quest was proceeding smoothly. The last question mark had indicated saving the knights being attacked by orcs in the White Forest. So, Callius specifically targeted the orcs fighting the knights. It was a bit dirty, but you could easily kill the orcs by a surprise attack from behind, or you could band together with the saved knights to increase your survivability. In order to raise the level of rewards, saving someone rather than killing an orc gave a higher score. And even if the saved knights hunted the orcs and beasts, they wouldn't add to his score, so it was efficient to move quickly before people died. Chalk. Leaving behind the fallen orc, spurting out blood, Callius turned and shouted at the fallen knight. Don't just lie around, pick up your sword. Ah, I see. Yes, yes. 
Time was running out. Combing the forest bit by bit to save the knights was not as easy as one might think. There was only one body, and there were many to save and many to kill. Even ten bodies would not be enough. I wish I had a flying sword skill, too, dot. It would have been much more comfortable, even if it was something at a lower level than a true flying sword art. What do you do with so many swords? They don't have scabbards, and it's getting harder and harder to carry multiple swords around the waist. It would be more convenient if I could make the swords hover in the air with a flying sword skill, or had an artifact or relic able to hold multiple swords at once. There will be more and more swords in the future. The number of swords required varies depending on the unique abilities of the swords. When I played the game, I had more than a dozen swords in my possession. Even then, if you wanted to carry multiple swords, you had to have a related artifact or a holy relic. Or, you needed a characteristic. However, I don't have any such characteristic, and most of those skills are of an unreasonably high level to learn directly. Artifacts and relics are not easy to obtain either, so for now, I have no choice but to grin and bear this inconvenience. However, if the number of swords keeps gradually increasing from now on, I wouldn't be able to ignore it anymore. I can't help it right now. Chwak. After cutting down another orc, Callius cried out to the bewildered knights who were still breathing heavily. If you are getting overwhelmed with strength when alone, face the enemy in twos or threes. If your skills aren't enough, fill the gap with numbers. Your skills aren't any better than stones scattered by the road, but if you throw those stones, even they become weapons. Yes. Ah. Die, you monster. Not all of these guys were even proper knights, so if they fought an orc warrior one on one, they'd lose a hundred times out of a hundred. Knight errants who came for the position of a knight of Gervain, the symbol of the north. They had their own experiences and swordsmanship, true, but in the end they were swords yet unforged. Damn, I'm feeling so unsettled that the trash noble personality characteristic keeps popping up. Sook! Still, it's getting easier. As the number of knights began to increase, they were becoming more and more used to the scenario. No matter how many orc warriors there were, if the knights dealt with them calmly, and if Callius helped out during each crisis, they could be killed without much effort. Number of orcs killed, 32. Number of beasts killed, 54. Number of people saved, 21. Reward, B, dash. After killing them for a while, the reward went up to B. Having defeated one more orc, Callius saw one young knight panting. If it had been three years ago, he would have also been panting like that. Right now, I'm able to cut all these orcs down. It was proof that the last three years had not been wasted. Pilgrim! Everything has been sorted out here. Callius saw an unknown knight reporting to him. Why are you reporting that to me? Seeing his look, the knight said ah, and introduced himself. My name is Alan. I never asked your name. Apologies. The big battle was coming to an end. After saving some of the scattered knights and moving with them together, the situation became more comfortable. But I can't release the tension. The woods are still bustling with enemies. I need to secure a path of retreat to slowly escape the forest and take care of the bigger picture. I will take the wounded and leave the forest. If there are orcs or beasts in the way, they have to be eliminated. If there are any knights left still breathing, we have to take them along too. So, the rewards can go up. Yes. I see. I will follow you, pilgrim. Just give me orders. Callius' eyebrows furrowed. The eyes of the rescued knights were twinkling needlessly. Fuck, how embarrassing. Orphan and the knights rushed out of the forest with Riven and Rene. Although they tried to be quick, the orcs attacked unexpectedly, so two out of the five knights were killed, and now there were only three knights in total escorting the young Gervain children. We must avoid them. The orcs are the enemies of the north. Why don't we fight, Orphan? 
I can fight too. My sword is broken. But even so, I'm not worse than most swordsmen of the North. This is an order by the name of the Patriarch's successor, Master Calavan. Father. Riven's mouth shut tightly when she said that it was Calavan's order. He didn't understand why. If you are born a Gervain, it is natural that you are one with the mission and pride of protecting the North. Orphan didn't inherit the bloodline of Gervain, but as a veteran knight of the North, she also wanted to run to the forest and behead the orcs right now. It's too early. But she was a knight. A knight, before a swordsman. For now, the first thing she had to do was to execute the command she had been given. Brother, what do you think happened to that fork guy? It was Rene who asked. Unlike the militant Riven, Rene had a more abstruse character. Both were children, but Rene wasn't as simple minded as Riven. Heh, <sighs> he stupidly headed to the depths of the forest, so he must have already been killed by the orcs. Even if he had some skills, he wouldn't be able to run away from the greenskins swarming the white forest. Did he fight them with a fork too? No one in this world fights with a fork. But didn't he fight you with a fork, brother? So, maybe he did that even with the orcs. I'm really curious. Maybe someday I'll be able to fight like that with a fork too. Riven's face turned red. Rene continued to chirp in a way that he couldn't tell if she was teasing him or not. Well, Riven couldn't tell, but mostly she was indeed making fun of him. Let us rest here for a while. It was a small cave located a little out of the white forest. Calavan ordered them to wait here with the children, and Orphan was obliged to stay here and protect the young Gervains until he came back. Orphan, Orphan! There are knights coming out. Is that so? I'm glad. She couldn't see. She could only see a few huge trees of the white forest. Her sight couldn't reach so far away to notice the details. Is this Gervain's bloodline? Her gray eyes looked like that of a clairvoyant, observing things happening far away. Yes. There are quite a few surviving knights. Ah. Uh, it's the fork. Orphan's ears perked up at the mention of a fork. Him too. He was alive. Well, with that skill, survival wasn't anything unexpected. No matter how strong the orc's axes were, it was not some swordsmanship that could be so easily defeated. No way. No, brother. That's his red cloak. Huh. But he looks just like us. Looks just like them. Riven's eyes widened in surprise at those words. He then rubbed his eyes as if to look more carefully, but he didn't seem to be able to see that much. I can't see them that well. Are you sure? There. Can't you see? Riven shook his head. Rene's eyes were more special than his. Then who? Was he a Gervain? Who is he? One of our uncles? But for somebody like that, a fork is too. Wasn't it too cruel? No, it's the first time I've seen a face like that. Wow, so handsome. I've never seen a face like that. That's all? Ah. I know who he is. The scapegrace. Scapegrace? Gervain's scapegrace. Even a young Gervain could not know the famous story. One of the greatest trashes in the history of the Gervain family bloodline spanning centuries. One of the greatest shames among all aristocrats. Even after he was kicked out of the family, he became a scum known as the prodigal son of the church. Callius von Gervain. Then you mean I lost to the biggest idiot in Gervain's history. Do you see that? Riven was ripping his hair out, but Rene kept looking at the distant scenery as if possessed by something leading a large group of knights, being chased by the orcs. He fights well. The other knights look a bit stupid, but the scapegrace, no, Callius. He fights really well. But nevertheless. There are too many orcs. Knights coming out of the white forest. And the black and green forms chasing them. 
the horde of orcs, looking like swarms of ants, were too many for the young woman to count. And soon. The border. It, it's broken. The border is. The northern border had been dyed green. Chapter 30 If you don't want to die, leave. His sword drawn, Callius oversaw the evacuation of the villagers with sharp eyes. Sir Callius. We've evacuated everybody. Sending them to Javarsh. It's all done. After evacuating the villagers near the border, Callius looked towards the horizon. Having already passed several villages, the orcs were now drawing near to the heart of the north, and they were occupying or setting fire to all the villages in their way. Javarsh. Step by step, towards the Jervain Castle. The greenskins were slowly approaching. Should have killed a few more in the forest. There were more orcs than I expected. Moreover, as we were leaving the forest, we were outnumbered and could not attack hastily. I thought about occupying the village and engaging them in urban warfare, but I discarded the notion. The knights didn't have infinite stamina. In addition, the orcs would have an advantage over the knights in that kind of street fights across buildings. It's just be rank, but it's already becoming difficult. I don't want S plus grade rewards, but shouldn't at least A plus grade be possible? If the reward is a sword, or something related to swords, just one grade difference will have a huge impact on how easily I can overcome the looming crisis. Originally, even a single fallen leaf can be the difference between ruin and survival during a crisis. It's still too early to be satisfied here. It's a quest that will never come again. Sir Callius. We must evacuate quickly. Let's go, Prince. 1. Callius. It was Alan and Aaron. Alan, the knight with the young face, considered him a knight and called him Sir, while Aaron looked at his Gervain hair and eyes, so called him by a noble title. He looked at the two of them and pondered for a moment, then shook his head. It didn't matter what he was called. Rather, there was something more urgent. Now the time for rescuing the knights was over. Since they'd left the forest, it'd be hard to save anybody for a while unless they intended to fight the orcs head on. Considering the quest, we have to reduce their numbers at least a little bit more before we go to Javarsh. That way the main characters will have better odds to survive. Although it's not shown in such detail, the higher the death toll amongst those likely to become the core of the North in the future, the worse the quest's reward level will become. The orcs will try to destroy the castle. There's no avoiding a siege. The battlefield will teeter between victory and defeat, each fleeting moment an arbiter of life and death. So, now. I have to nod their numbers, even if only the slightest bit. The orc front line still numbered only a little over 100. If that's the case, it's still worth doing. If they join the orcs slowly advancing from the rear, the overall number would be over a thousand. So, I have to kill some. Callius observed the state of the knights waiting for him. Knights with frayed, worn-out armor and dulled swords who had been running and fighting repeatedly for the past few days without even being able to sleep properly. Thanks to that, most of them were in rather terrible condition. Besides, they all had suffered major and minor injuries here and there, making the scene even more tragic. Fuck, come on. They're saying we have to go. Noisy. Even if somebody is overflowing with energy, it's unknown if he has a brain, so his condition can't be said to be very good either. Still, I have to kill some more orcs. Is there no way? Master. Let's drink some of this water. The water here is really cold and sweet. Water? Where did water come from all of a sudden? Is there a well here? Yeah. It's right over there. As Callius looked at the large well at the center of the village, he suddenly remembered the stigma engraved on the back of his hand. Fuck. Yes, there is this one way. Good job, Bruns. Yes, yes. Bruns, suddenly receiving Callius' praise for the first time in his life, stiffened with a puzzled face. 
Leaving him standing there frozen, Callius immediately took out a pouch from the stigma and dumped its contents into the well. Tack, tack. In the forest near Javarsh. Calavan was biting his nails nervously as he waited for someone. Brother. Are you here? Luthien. Calavan grabbed the person who appeared suddenly and stared at him with bloodshot eyes that seemed positively murderous. Why didn't you tell me? There are so many orcs out there. Calm down, Brother Calavan. What's the problem? Isn't this a problem? The whole northern border. The Pillar of Carpe is being ravaged by those savages. The usual Calavan, who always had a relaxed smile on his face, was nowhere to be found. He now looked like a gambler who had squandered all his fortune at the gambling den. The man called Luthien shook off Calavan's hands without difficulty. His two hands had enough power to force away Calavan's strong hands, trained for decades, very easily. Brother. Everything is going according to plan. Only in this way will you be able to inherit the North's heritage intact. Only then can we be rewarded for our efforts. You're sure? Yes. Flightless dragons in their nests are just prey, aren't they? A wounded dragon in its nest is just a wild beast. The current Gervain Patriarch. Albert and von Gervain. You have to be prepared for at least this amount of bloodshed if you want to catch him. Creation supports Brother Calavan. How can you succeed in such a great cause when you get excited so easily? You have to be more poised. Yes. I got too excited. It was all thanks to Creation that I was able to get this far, but I forgot that for a moment. Yes, yes. I understand. Now, the highlands are just around the corner. By sacrificing the green filth of the north, a new master of Gervain will be born. Let's just wait quietly for now. Those greenskins will take care of everything. The man called Luthien assured Calavan like that, and then slowly turned his head. At his slight nod, the hooded and masked ones behind him straightened their backs. In their hands, for a brief moment, flashed the blue blades of spears. They're going to arrive tomorrow. Callius, who had taken refuge in the nearby mountains for a while to avoid the advance of the orcs, breathed in the bleak pre-dawn air. The cloak of twilight warded away the cold, but after fighting and running for days, his whole body was drenched with sweat. I want to wash. But there was no room for that kind of luxury. Number of orcs killed, 52. Number of beasts killed, 61. Number of people saved, 41. Reward, B+, plus, dash. Callius' gray eyes turned calm as he saw a knight approaching him. What the hell is happening? I heard that nothing like this has happened in nearly a hundred years. He was a knight belonging to the Gervain family. It was not completely unprecedented, but this was the first time that so many orcs had pushed in so indiscriminately. Originally, battles between Gervain and the orcs had happened before. However, their battles over the White Forest never ended decisively for either side, and so their war had continued endlessly. It's just a result of time and planning. What do you mean? It just means that the time has come. What was always about to happen had finally happened. Fatalite's will originally was that kind of a story. Orcs and Gervain. The white forest and the beasts at its center. A wheel that keeps turning. And the forces trying to reach out to those demonic beasts using the wheel. They're playing their own game. Who would want to see Gervain fall the most? Which nation? The Empire. The fanatics who call themselves the only holy empire and worship the god of creation. I don't know how they trick the orcs into this. But it won't be that easy. I can't let them ruin Carpe. The village was already full of orcs. It was around lunchtime when the knights rescued by Callius had left the village. It was already almost dawn now. The orcs would occupy the village, rest, and set off again in the morning. At their speed, 
they would knock on the castle gates in three days, leading to a battle. After that, the rest of the orc army would arrive, bringing even more chaos to the battlefield. So before that, Callius needed to reduce their numbers, even if only a little. Sook. As Callius got up and put Lucen and Lowe's around his waist, the knights who had been resting froze at the sight. They seemed to know why their savior was moving. There were some who rose, some who couldn't decide whether to rise or not, and some who sat and sent anxious glances. The total number was forty-four. Originally, more than three hundred had entered the White Forest. They were the only ones left. Heads, shoulders, and legs were all covered in bandages. Their eyes fluttered aimlessly, and they trembled with anxiety. Their sword arms, full of hesitation. They'd fought in the forest, escaped, and then fought again. By the time they had reached this hiding place they were already trembling in fear, their bodies refusing to move any further. It had only been half a day since then, so when thinking of moving again, this was the natural result. They needed to take a break, they really needed rest. Callius looked at the horizon in the distance. The sky was utterly dark. The darkest hour, just before sunrise. He put his hand on the hilt. They will go to Javarsh. The castle that was the seat of Jervain, who represented the north. It was the orc's final destination. Sooner or later, they will destroy the gates, and eventually kill everyone in the castle. The northern parts of the kingdom will then be theirs. It was their long-awaited dream. To become the ruler of the north. To reclaim their ancestral lands. They had such a destiny. But I'm not going to let that happen. Strength seeped into the knight's sword arms at that declaration. Callius was speaking calmly, but there was some kind of power in his voice. An assertiveness, and confidence. And the arrogance, characteristic of aristocrats. Together, those qualities emanated the presence of Callius von Gervain. Our enemies are over a hundred, but there are only forty of us. Nevertheless, I will go meet them. We need to reduce that number a bit. That way, the rewards will be higher. An opportunity that will never come again. You can't just be satisfied with a B+. It's reckless. A young knight bit his lip and spoke. There was no strength in his voice, his head down and his gaze towards the ground. He was trembling. His name was Alan, he said. Even in the forest, he was a brave knight who'd followed Callius without hesitation. But now, he was trembling with fear. He was afraid. Was it your first large-scale battle? That blonde hair is like Leon, although the age is closer to mine, so it keeps catching my eye. It's not reckless. That's not the last of them. Even if it's a hundred now, their number will grow more and more as the days go by. If it's a hundred now, in the end, it will become thousands. It's not some simple quest that ends overnight. But by the same token, the level of compensation can increase exponentially. It's still fine. Before that great army of thousands arrives. Right now, when those orcs are blindly slaughtering the village's food supply, is an opportunity. The time now is before sunrise, the darkest hour that precedes that dawn. The odds have already been adjusted. There is a reason why we evacuated the villagers but left all the food in the village untouched. What's the reason? Callius had bought a lot of things in Tristar. In going through that purchase history, one could find some things that were quite useful even during a war. Because most of the ingredients of the holy water were quite poisonous. Thank <laughs> you.